to have discussion and debate and throughout the day I will absolutely be welcoming questions from those in the room and those that are joining us live on the live stream throughout the day. So to kickstart proceedings I'd like to welcome to the lectern the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Lincoln, Professor Neil Jester, to offer his first part of the welcome to the event. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, as it actually is welcome, very warm welcome to this saving summit uh, for 2022. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to offer the welcome to our thought leadership programme delivered today in partnership with our workplace savings partner, Cushon. This type of event is crucial in bringing to the fore discussion and debate that will not only reflect the financial challenges which many individuals are facing in the current economic and social landscape, but importantly for us at the University of Lincoln to also consider what will best support our graduates who will be entering employment over the next few years. That is why today we want to ensure that whilst we discuss how employers, government and providers can support embedding a culture and practices that enable good saving habits, we frame the debate through a lens of future employee needs. We need to always remember that our students represent the workforce of tomorrow. I'm therefore very pleased to see the student voice represented in the room and maybe more importantly to see our students speaking on the agenda. There is not a day goes by at the university when I cannot see the financial challenges that are presenting themselves in society and the constraints these place on both employees and our students. I'm also seeing how finances intrinsically impact on the mental and emotional health of students and of my colleagues. As an employer and as I lead an educational establishment, I personally feel the sense of responsibility in ensuring that we are doing all we can to not only proactively provide support to those facing financial difficulties, but also to provide education and support to encourage and build the habit of saving. I'm therefore delighted to see that the relationship between financial and mental health will be discussed today by Dr Alex George, following up some of the work he has supported with our students. At the University of Lincoln, we continually strive to have a positive impact on society, educate good citizens and to influence positive change. I hope that the white paper that Cushon has produced showcasing the successful pilot held for student workers at the University of Lincoln will be an influential document. It encapsulates the spirit of the discussion today and it could and should shape a framework that our graduates will benefit from. We must take note of the changing requirements to support financial well-being and saving habits. This white paper captures the spirit of the auto-enrolment pension legislation this legislation has been successful in inculcating positive habits in employees by supporting and incentivising saving at source. The White Paper builds on these successful <coughs> principles but challenges us to question if the financial journey that a new graduate joining an employer today needs to be enhanced with a variety of savings vehicles and with the flexibility to support their changing life needs. So whether you're joining us in the room or on the live stream, welcome. I encourage you all to join in the discussions to help shape future thinking. Great discussions and insights like those we are facilitating today are a very rounded way to approach change. And I hope that we can make this event a regular occurrence as societal needs, economic factors and legislation continue to change. With that in mind, the sooner we start the discussions, then the sooner we can start to initiate change. So I'll now hand back to Ian, Head of Reward and at uh, University of Lincoln, to talk a little bit about our partnership with Cushion. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you, Vice-Chancellor. And, and yes, it is a huge welcome to those that are in the room or on the live stream, or, or indeed those that will be watching these conversations at a later date. As part of my welcome, 
I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the background as to why we are here today at the Saving Summit event, and it seems very apt that partway through the morning the Chancellor will indeed be delivering a briefing um, that will we'll discuss how the challenges will face us in the future and we'll have to rethink again how we support our employees. But around 18 months ago at the University of Lincoln, we identified a problem with our unique group of campus jobs workers, which is our employment function that offers around 1,000 1, students the chance to work at the University of Lincoln alongside their studies, gaining vital work experience to put on their CV and of course some earnings to support themselves uh, whilst they're a student. Now this unique group of young workers fell under the auto-enrolment pension savings limits in respect of age and in respect of their earnings levels. So our situation was that we found ourselves with less than 10 of our student workers who were actually having a workplace savings scheme, receiving contributions from the employer whilst they were working for us at the university. At this point, we picked up a conversation with Cushon, who were already providing our workplace ISA for our staff, and we decided that we needed to better understand what more we could do to support instilling saving habits into this group of young workers. So we ran some focus groups, and the outcomes were quite resounding and can probably be summarised as follows. Firstly, the concept of saving into a pension feels very unrelatable when you're a younger student working alongside studies. Secondly, there isn't always an incentivization from the employer to support good saving habits, which when left to a standalone decision, often means that funds are diverted elsewhere. And thirdly, and importantly for us as a university, there needs to be education to support some of the terminology and the relevance of financial language to make it relevant and understandable to the financial journey that takes a student through to retirement, which is a very different landscape now to what it was before. So on this basis, we work with Cushon on a social experiment to enrol our student workers engaged through campus jobs into an alternative savings scheme, which was a workplace ISA whereby, as an employer, we also contributed to their savings pot. The students had visibility to track their savings on their phone app, to tangibly see the employee and the employer contributions going into their pot, to make decisions around where those funds are invested, and to <coughs> own the decision-making and use initiatives such as the Lifetime ISA to receive top-up to help save towards a house, and invest ethically with an accessibility to support their early and mid financial goals. The outcome of this was that we managed to achieve getting only an 8% opt-out rate of the workplace ISA scheme, which mirrors the same sort of take-up that you typically see from the auto-enrolment pension scheme. And we now have more than 1,000 of our student workers saving regularly with the support of their employer into a workplace ISA scheme, positively impacting their financial confidence and well-being prior to entering workplaces. And that is why we are hosting this event today in partnership with Cushon to bring together thought leaders in the room to discuss how we solve the financial challenge facing workers today, and there'll be lots more discussion about that problem today, but to future-proof our plans to ensure that our graduates who will be the workforce of tomorrow are also looked after. So today we're going to explore the workplace savings challenge from the perspective of government, employers, future employees, and also discuss the links through to mental and emotional health. We have a great lineup of speakers and we'll be ensuring that we leave enough time to encourage an interactive debate in the room through question and answer sessions. In the room, we'll bring you into the discussions through raising your hand, and we'll have a roving microphone that will come and pay you a visit. If you are on the live stream, leaving a question, then uh, our comments will be brought into the room through my colleagues at the back of the room, and we'll raise the questions with the speakers today. 
Following the first two sessions, there will be a 15-minute break at 11 a.m., which in the room means an exit for coffee. If you're on the live stream, it means you pop and put the kettle on. Uh, the event will finish just after 12.30. So let's get our saving summit and debate started. And I'd now like to introduce our first thought leadership session of the day that will be a panel session that I'll be chairing and moving over to join the panel. And I'm delighted to welcome to the stage Duncan Brown, Independent Reward Advisor and Principal Associate with the Institute of Employment Studies, and Joe Phillips, the Director of Research and Innovation at Nest Insights. And this session will focus on the role of employers in supporting financial resilience and why the workplace is the right place to get people saving. So welcome, and can I ask you both to join me on the stage? Morning both, oh, yeah. thank you for joining me. Um, so first of all, let's, let's set some context. And I think post pandemic, we've seen really significant changes to the way that we're working and that relationship with work. And the challenges of achieving financial stability seems to be greater and harder than ever for those particularly entering the workplaces. So, you know, this feels like a time where we need to be experimenting with things to try the trial and error process to get things right and find new practices. So I'll start with you, Joe. At Nest Insight, you know, your role in terms of experimentation and identifying best practice. I just wonder if you could tell me a little bit about some of the work that Nest Insight have been undertaking. Thanks, Ian, um, and, and great to be here today and part of this conversation. Um, so Nest Insight is a public benefit research and innovation centre. Our focus is on trying to understand the challenges that people face in getting to financial security, both today and in later life, and importantly, to try and find solutions to those challenges. So to test um, ideas, pilots, um, pilot new ways of doing things in, in the real world. So I spend a lot of time working collaboratively with different providers, with different employers. Um, we have three workplace savings trials up and running at the moment, um, each with a different provider and different employers taking part. Um, one is our sidecar savings trial. Um, and there we're trialling a hybrid approach to workplace saving, which combines shorter term savings, so trying, trying to help people build up a, an emergency savings buffer with longer term retirement saving to, to really try and um, join up those two different challenges of, of putting in place an, an emergency savings buffer today and also once that is in place, saving more for retirement because we know that a lot of people aren't saving as much as they need to to get to the outcomes they would like to in retirement. Um, our second trial is working with Suez um, Recycling and Recovery UK and their credit union Transave UK and there we're trialling an opt-out approach to, to payroll saving um, and, and I suspect we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, we've also just launched another workplace savings trial working with WageStream. Um, again we're looking at different approaches to support people with getting started with saving there so, so again an opt-out approach and also a, a sort of active choice approach so asking people yes no you know do you want to save um, and, and each of those different trials is looking at different touch points, different solutions, different ways of supporting people. And, and I think, you know, as you said, Ian, sort of listening hard to what people need, as you've done at the University of Lincoln, and then testing and learning and improving and, and building on those learnings, um, I, I think is absolutely what we need to do because the challenges at the moment are, are great and getting greater. Fantastic. And we'll, we'll touch on some of those uh, outcomes, I think, from some of those trials. And Duncan, just talk a little bit about some of the work that you've been doing with the Institute of Employment Studies and, and the CIPD of looking at you know, what's changed in the world of savings and what practices look like. Sure, and thank you. Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks very much to, to you and Kushan for inviting me along. Uh, it's lovely to be here back in person. Um, but um, yeah, so IES was it's quite an interesting organisation. It was founded in 1968, the year of the student revolutions. And it was basically a group of big company HR directors who said, look, we're getting fed up of getting pushed out of decisions in organisations. And we need some evidence that all this stuff around good HR practice, paying people well, uh, paying them to come and get quali master's qualifications at universities, etc., that it pays off. And so that was what the organisation was 
uh, uh, designed to uh, address, along with particularly the difficulties of employee relations at that time as we were coming into the kind of uh, 70s and, and years of, of discontent. So we didn't do a very good job on the last one, did we? Given the current amount of industrial action around, including in this sector. Um, but on the first, we've produced a lot of evidence over the years on uh, what good HR uh, and financial uh, savings practice is in employment. And um, in 2017 it was, so if you can remember that way back to COVID, um, the CIPD, which is the HR Institute for, um, for all the HR profession, trains them and regulates them and all that sort of stuff. So they've got about 250,000 members. I, I worked there about 20 years ago. Um, they uh, hired us to write their first guide on uh, employee financial well-being. They'd never had one before. And in fact, I, I jointly author one of the student textbooks in the area, a Handbook of Reward Management with Michael Armstrong. And the last edition, which I think was the sixth, um, that was the first one as well, 2019, that we had a, a separate chapter on um, financial well-being. We'd obviously had stuff on pensions and benefits before. And I think even then in 2017, it was clear that um, we were in a very unusual period. Uh, real wages had been falling uh, and um, young people were suffering the worst. They had suffered the biggest declines uh, in their standard of living and real wages. And so, um, but at that time, I think employers um, were not doing a lot about it when we were trying to sell MAS funded research, money advisory funded research. A lot of employers said, what do we want to do this for? We're not a bank. Uh, or worse, you know, what if we give the wrong advice and people come back and sue us? So there was a lot of reluctance outside the HR community to engage. So a lot of that guidance was on the business case. Why should you, uh, why should employers invest in financial well-being? Now, 2022, we've obviously got massive, you know, cost of living crisis. See Justin Greening on Twitter this morning talking about the skills crisis. So hopefully the Chancellor will be saying something about supply side investment in skills, given that we still got over a million vacancies, even though we're, um, uh, we're uh, going into, uh, into a recession. Um, so in a way, and um, post COVID, the need to address people's financial well-being, you know, citizen advice on Monday, 80% of us are worried about our financial well-being at all income levels. Again, the highest levels is for young people. And um, citizens' advice, um, um, their consultations around financial issues have doubled over the past 12 months. So there's clearly a, a cost of living crisis. Uh, and we're just doing the update to the guide, which will be out early next year. And that's going to be looking a lot more at what do you do? So if, if the vice chancellors and the chief executives now are accepting the case for employers, indeed that employers have a responsibility, not just to pay staff uh, above the legal minimum wage at or above it, but also to address their financial well-being, um, then what should they be doing? And that, you know, COVID in this weird sense was beneficial in that, you know, vice chancellors, chief executives open the checkbooks um, they said, yep, we need to invest in employee well-being. A lot of that was obviously around physical well-being, protecting staff from COVID and stuff. But um, the emphasis then switched very heavily to mental health. Uh, and obviously we'll be hearing later on from experts about the links between financial well-being and mental health, which are very strong. So, yeah, I'll talk a bit more if you're interested in what we're finding out for the guide at the moment. Brilliant. And I'm going to take one of your points and, and pose a question to Joe. So I think Duncan's outlining a bit of a change in relationship, Joe, with employers where financial well-being needs to be more important. And we know typically now we find it where there is a challenge that a lot of employees don't have a rainy day pot to fall back on. Whereas prior, and I'm sure when the first publications came out, it was OK to talk about a pension on what day one of employment as being you know, the best benefit. I just wonder if you've seen through your work at Nest Insight a change in relationship of why is it that employers need to be much more involved in the financial wellbeing picture? Yeah, I think you know, that's a really good question and we do hear different responses from employers, I think depending on the relationship they have with their employees and the culture they have in their workplace. But I think 
you know, the, the evidence has been building and the evidence to support the business case is, is pretty strong now. And, you know, people like Duncan have, have gathered that together in, in a way that makes it pretty hard to refute. So we know that having some emergency savings helps people avoid financial hardship. Um, you know, step change research showed that if people have a thousand pounds in savings, that reduces their chances of falling into problem debt by half. And that problem debt is, is, is the downward spiral that causes the anxiety and the stress that means that people aren't able to focus, to concentrate, to, to be present um, in their job. So I think that, you know, the business case that supporting employees to have a buffer of savings for dealing with those unexpected expenditure or, or income shocks is good for their mental health, which is good for productivity, it's good for retention, it's good for recruitment. You know, I think, I think most employers understand that and are focused on that now and are switching to the how you know what do we what do we do about this I think as well you know these things are interconnected so at our starting point when we started our research was on retirement saving but we quickly understood that you can't think about that in isolation and actually if people aren't doing okay and financially secure today then they're not going to be able to save for retirement or or if they are saving for retirement their retirement savings won't go as far when they get there because a hundred thousand pounds in a pension pot looks very different if you're debt free and a homeowner than, than if you're indebted and, and, and renting so I, I think employers increasingly understand that these things are are relevant that there is a business case for them and, and are starting to look at the kind of how what do we do to make a difference and support this and i think you're absolutely right to the fact that we start to see where you provide financial vehicles or financial support now less as we're offering a benefit with a cost attached to it but it is more a business decision that it's investment in the workforce that is preventative of other problems that might occur Duncan, um, do you have um, any thoughts on that aspect of for employers now and why employers need to be involved in this saving scenario, much more so for what it actually helps them achieve? Well, yeah, it's a, we've seen a funny reversal driven by COVID, I think, initially of initially not seeing the case and whatever it was, I think the CRPD's annual reward management survey, only 12% of employers before COVID had a financial wellbeing strategy. And not surprising that's doubled, but I'm amazed it's still less than half. But anyway, let's hope for further progress with uh, organisations like Joe carrying out the trials and, and progressing them. Um, but um, yeah, they, um, the, the case I think is, is clear now. They're putting, pro you know, so we've got auto escalation in, in corporate pensions. We've got online financial advice. We've got all sorts of additional products, but there's a sense that employers now are chucking all this stuff at the problem. They've got a problem of employee financial wellbeing. They're chucking all this stuff at it and hoping some of it sticks. And the basic process of understanding, hang on, where, what, what's the situation with your employees? What actually are their needs? Um, and, and how do those vary by different segments of the population? Um, what's, what's your overall approach to doing that and how do these different products fit into that? Some of them may not work. Uh, I've just been doing very well-meaning charity, running some employee focus groups and a group of graduates, excellent uh, pension, uh, double match, so the, the employee uh, as the employee contributes an extra 1% above the statutory minimum, the employer matches that twice. But the, the group of graduates I had, almost no one, had, they'd all opted out of the corporate scheme. And it's like, what are you doing? You know, you're chucking, even if you don't add anything, you're chucking away 4% of pay. And they said, literally, we just can't afford it. Literally, you know, living in London, you know, the uh, tube fares go up, they've got to move out a zone um, because then they can't afford the rent in the zone they're in, weirdly. Um, and so it's that, you know, people are my gen. Well, I was kind of on the transitional generation. You take my dad's generation, you know, 30 years in the same company, uh, corporate DB pension. God, he, do you know, he even had, he even had private medical cover in uh, retirement. Unbelievable now. You couldn't buy that benefit now, however much you had. And, and you know, it, it's, um, it made his life 
relatively straightforward. Now you look at the issues, you know, even I face, I've got all these pots around, drew my first pension, you know, do I do an annuity? Do I do an annuity or drawdown? Decide annuity because I'm conservative. Do I have an inflation linked annuity or a fixed annuity? Guess who chose the bloody fixed annuity <laughs> just before inflation rocketed? So that's worth 15% less than it was when I got it. So that was a great decision, wasn't it? What do I know? But, but um, no, so, you know, that the senior folk aren't always the best people to know. And that's why understanding your people is so important to address their needs, really. And there's some great examples as well, uh, as, as the Vice Chancellor say, across the sector now of, you know, some who can afford it paying cash bonuses to students and employees, some just keeping buildings open with the heating on, you know, really innovative things, I think. Yeah, fantastic. And Joe, Duncan touched on there some of the barriers to getting people saving in what's, what sounds like it, it's the evolution that things have to change and what used to work for previous generations doesn't always work for the next generation. Just in terms of the, uh, the trials that uh, Nest Insight are undertaking to advise legislation going forward, what, what do you find are the other barriers to individuals actually saving? Um. There are lots, yeah. and that's why, the, you know, that's why this is difficult, and it's also why employers have the potential to play a really powerful role in their employees' lives. And I think particularly when we think about young people coming into the workforce, getting people off on a good start is much easier than fixing problems further down the line. Um, so I think, you know, why is it difficult for people to say, first of all, it's really complex. There's lots of choice. You know, if you're if you're starting to save yourself, there's a there's a range of different providers and products, and you're bamboozled with interest rates that actually on five hundred pounds of savings make very little difference. But you feel like you need to sit down and look at comparison tables. You know, all of that is really complex and difficult. And um, people don't have the headspace right now. I think as well, self confidence, and I think this is something that can often be overlooked. Is is that I want to save, but I'm not sure if I can do it. So I'm not going to sign up to do it. I think I might fail. And actually we've seen that when people are helped to save, actually they're much more able to save than they would have believed that they could be. Um, there's just inertia. Inertia is sort of really boring, but really persistent. So, um, you know, how many things do we all have on our to-do list that we want to do, that we know we should do, that we don't get around to doing? And I think, you know, when people are firefighting right now for the day to day that that gets worse you know it's really hard to think about the future if you're concentrating on how do I get to the end of the week <coughs> and then there's just friction which is actually really important so if you're signing up to something at every step of the way you have to input information and make decisions so we you know we see that when we ask people how much do you want to save a month like half of them drop off at that point because that's quite a difficult thing to think mm -hmm. about so I think you know those are lots of barriers with getting started with saving I think there are also are barriers with saving regularly. So, you know, if you have a savings account, remembering to put some money into it regularly or knowing that you can kind of set up automatic saving. I think where people's income is variable, it's really difficult to commit to a regular pound amount if you're worried, you know, am I going to be able to afford that next month? And then we know as well that as human beings, we, we feel losses more than we feel gains. So if I've got the money in my pocket and then I've got to put it in a savings account, even though it's still my money, it feels like I'm having something taken away from me. So I think all of those barriers, actually payroll saving can play such an important role in overcoming them. And, and you know, payroll is a, a, a simple yet underappreciated mechanism, I think. You know, if, if money comes out of my pay before I feel it in my pocket, it's much easier to save it. If it comes out of my pay, it happens automatically, so I don't need to do anything. It just keeps going until I change it or stop it. Um, I think the barriers to getting started with saving, even with a good workplace savings um, solution in place, are much harder to overcome, and I think that's where, you know, we're starting to look at opt-out approaches, clearly University of Lincoln as well, and perhaps we can talk a bit more about that. Yeah. And Joe, just touching on a point now, and I'm aware we've got the Chartered Institute of Payroll Professionals, uh, often the unsung heroes of the scene, just Absolutely. in the room with us today. So you know, ju just how important is it in the, in the NEST research over where deductions are forming those habits by coming straight from pay? And how important 
are perhaps those paywall professionals in making things work going forward. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think payroll professionals are heroes and they have you know, so much power to make a difference to people. And um, we, we hear in, in the work we do where people are making savings via payroll, um, that they find that much easier. They really appreciate that mechanism. They talk about, you know, it just happens in the background. I don't have to think about it. And having that savings there gives me real peace of mind. So actually just that, that mechanism attaching it to pay and, and taking the money before I'm paid, before it sort of gets to me, is, is so powerful. And I think we can sort of underestimate the power of that. Yeah, fantastic. And, and Duncan, just lifting that conversation back up into uh, the importance really of the workplace and that relationship with an employer in being part of the solution. Do you just want to add your thoughts in terms of why is the workplace the right place to solve this problem? and how intrinsic is the employer to the solution? Well, I don't know if you, if you saw the, uh, the, this year's British uh, Household Attitude Survey, but it, it showed that more of us are still finding our life partner in the workplace, actually, even than internet dating. It's just ahead. Kind of internet dating has been coming up like that, but the most common place in which you find your partner for life is in the workplace. So it's, I mean, it's a pretty important place. Um, and um, yeah, obviously employees are looking for support from their employers um, and um, those employers have that responsibility. Uh, you know, the good employers recognise that, the bad employers uh, maybe haven't in the past but they're being forced to now by the, the challenges of that their uh, employees are facing and of course we've got a recruitment crisis as well. Uh, so employees are moving. We've had a record number of voluntary uh, moves in the economy over the last 12 months. So good practice actually is really starting to influence everybody now. It's really starting to spread. I thought Joe summarised the barriers uh, really well to it. But I think more employers are, are taking that responsibility. And, and as I said, the question now is, is, is really how do they do that? What's the best uh, mechanism for to do that rather than just firing generic products that, that won't meet the needs of the uh, particular needs of their employees. Mm. And, and Joe, auto enrolment taught us an awful lot as a solution. It taught us that employers are important in the solution and the education piece. It taught us that deductions from payroll that people will stop in a scheme if um, it happens at source and the decision making is, is removed to a large extent. I was just thinking, what, what lessons can we take from auto enrolment of what's worked or what do we need to just adapt going forward to pick up on, on the good things but tweak the things that maybe just need to be adapted to where we are now? Yeah, so um, in our sidecar savings trial, we learned quite quickly that people appreciate payroll saving, that those who sign up to save through payroll save persistently that that gives them peace of mind, that that helps people build a savings habit to grow into savers who you know, grow in confidence and save more over time. But, but we also found that not many people sign up to save. You know, if, if you have to actively sign up to save, you don't reach as many people as, as you would want to. And, and that's not unique to our trial when we started to look at other data on payroll saving take up is pretty low you know it's hard to get it above five percent even with great communications um, so uh, because of our background and, and because we sit within a, a, a pension provider set up for auto enrollment we, we quite quickly started to think about can, can we use that opt-out mechanism in this situation and, and we've done some work around what it takes to be able to do that and kind of what the regulatory considerations are and, and then as soon as we could we, we tried it in the real world so we've been partnering with Suez um, they and their credit union Transave UK have been real pioneers here and, and at Suez for the past year if you're a new joiner to Suez you receive a series of communications that Suez wants to support you to save um, if you don't opt out you'll start saving 40 pounds a month in every pay period, easy to opt out, just contact HR and you're done. 
easy to change the amount you save, easy to stop at any point, easy to withdraw your savings. Um, but, but if you do nothing, you start saving. So, so we flip the default instead of having to, to, you know, if you do nothing, you don't save. In, in this model, if you do nothing, you do save. We haven't removed any choice in that model. You know, you still have the choice whether to save or not. And I think that's really important. And that is a lesson from pensions auto enrolment. I, I worked on some of the, the early communications around auto enrolment, the um, research around the pensions regulated letters that are provided to employers. And um, the early versions of those letters sort of almost hid the opt-out um, and, and people were really angry you know this is taking my choice away the minute you put that up front you know you have the choice you can opt out we're not trying to to kind of engineer anybody's decisions we're just trying to make it easier for people to do the thing they want to do at that point people were relieved and you know this is so helpful you're, you're kind of helping me to do the thing I want to do so, so I think there are learnings around communications but, but but the really exciting thing in the Suez trial is that we have gone from in an opt-in model about one percent of employees saving through payroll to in an opt-out model just over 50 percent of employees saving through payroll and I think just the power of that mechanism to make that step change in participation and talking to the employees who say you know, I'm saving, I've always wanted to do this, but I didn't get around to it or I didn't think I could, but now I am saving every month. And, and the other thing we've seen is that not only are more people saving, but people are saving more because that default is quite powerful. So where people might have gone with the minimum, you know, maybe save five pounds or 10 pounds a month, actually, most people stick with that default of 40 pounds a month. Um, and that means that in the opt-in model, the sort of average savings after four months is about £30. In the opt-out model, the average savings after four months is about £130. And I think the other important thing from the Suez trial is one of the questions we had is, OK, well, if, if people are joining the company and you've, you've got the, the auto save and you've also got pensions auto enrolment, is one going to impact the other? Are we going to see that if we have an opt-out approach to, to shorter term savings that people opt out of longer term savings and that hasn't been the case there's been no impact on yeah. on pensions opt out levels so so i think you know we, we have something really powerful in pensions auto enrollment that we are exploring in this context i think the next step would be to look at how you join those things up for people and, and sort of start to allow people to make choices and, and you know think about where employer contributions go and where individual contributions go but but you know i, I think we are very optimistic about the power of the mechanism in, in this different setting. And it really does show that importance of the transparency and the relationship with the employer that an employee has of trust, really. Um, before I open up for, for general questions, Duncan, I just, just your last thoughts sure, there on sure. the success measures of yeah. auto enrolment that you see across the Institute of Employment Studies research and your activities for what, what are the good things that we should embrace and adapt and evolve to go forward and, and what needs the uh, the change. Yeah, I hope we're not sounding too sort of Pollyanna-ish in, you know, with the crisis out there. But I share Joe, it's weird, out of these multiple crises we've had, I'm feeling really optimistic that people are doing something. And I think Joe's points about inertia, which is one of the biggest barriers to saving, as she said, um, for the CIPD guide, we've done a YouGov survey of a couple of thousand folks. And uh, interestingly, most of the findings, irrespective of income level, the majority of people are worried about the financial well-being um, and, and key dimensions of that, really in terms of what the barriers are, is lack of income, which is not surprising. People have always said that. But also it's kind of ease of doing it um, because it's difficult in many organisations to do the saving, as, as you said, Joe. And so having the time... Uh, getting, you know, presented if you're in the typical company flexible benefits plan, you know, you might have 70 funds and you're supposed to run off the PDF of the guide in terms of which funds you're supposed to put your pension contribution on. Guess what? Most people, 90 odd percent, leave it to the default option. So, you know, using an, an employer's copying this approach increasingly to make a kind of uh, auto contribution, which you've got to default out of and spreading that across 
what's their benefits offer. That's the first thing, get the floor. And the second thing, as you said, is good communication, which is not chucking loads of stuff at folks, but actually targeting it to make the right decisions for them. So a couple of examples, in one actually in higher education, um, HR had some really good stuff to communicate. Finance have said, you can't use mobile phones, be be presumably because of security. So, I mean, you've just, you know, I mean, my 25 and 27 year olds, they, if, you know, if they haven't got their phone, I never communicate with them, you know? So, you know, that's for a start addressing that. But, um, you know, actually getting those communication channels right for your employer. I saw a great example uh, of an employer where um, what they did at the end of the year in that, you know, you usually get your total reward statement. It's just got pay, pension, maybe some value for your, for your uh, rest of your benefits. Um, what they've done, they've got an employee discount scheme to show all the savings that they've negotiated. Uh, with it. And uh, what it gives you, it gives you a statement of how much you've saved that year on using those discounts. And what they find is once people start doing it, they think, wow, I've saved that much. And it encourages them, A, to, to use those things more, and then B, to look at the other benefits offers if they've got an employee saving schemes. And they're much more likely to take up some of those as well. So I think, it, you know, there's still need for tons of improvement. But I think yeah, we've opened the door now. We've opened some of the budget door and the mental door at the top of our organisations. And it's down to people like us, I think, to get out there now and, and, and really spread the word on how best to do it. It does very much feel like we're in that period of experimentation, doesn't it, with both, both the work of Nest Insight and what we're seeing in employment And practices. for government, you know, because yeah. your scheme, you know, you've got to look at the legality of some of this stuff, because rightly, particularly pensions, is really well protected and and regulated and you know it's taken us best part of a decade to get combined de uh, defined contribution schemes in um you know the legislation with that which, which royal mail is pushing the first big one it, trying to get the balance of db and dc essentially but that was illegal until um uh, before last year so uh it's not easy it needs pioneers and innovators like you um but it, yeah that i think there's loads of people ready to follow Lots of cogs to fall into place. So I'm going to throw it open to the room for questions. And the hands are going up. If we've got the microphone, just come in down at the front here. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'm Amber. I work at Salary Finance. Um, so I, I thought it was really interesting what you're talking about in terms of savings. And like 40% of people in the UK have less than £100 in savings at the moment. So like they don't have that like buffer, as you were saying. Um, in terms of flipping it back to young people, when you come out of university, often you are in a cycle of you've had an overdraft with interest free up to like, I think mine was up to like £2,000. And I think, um, how would you position going into savings when you're having an influx of people who technically are living in this debt world, debt cycle? And like, how would you, how would you think about addressing that before positioning savings? Because they might think that's like a bit insensitive, not the right path for them at that point. Um, Joe, there's a really innovative model, uh, a US employer, Abbott, um, they have a lot of graduates in their workforce um, and they, they realised that the young people entering their workforce were opting out of pension saving because they were in debt, in, in this case they were looking at, at student debt in particular, student loans, um, and what they decided to do was instead of saying the employee needs to be contributing into the pension to get the employer contribution. Actually, if they're paying off their student loan, then we'll still make the employer contribution to the pension. And I think that's a really good example of an employer thinking, okay, we've, we've got a budget for a contribution to something. Actually, could we be a bit more flexible about the circumstances under which we make that contribution, recognising that, that people are in a different place when they come into the workforce? So, so I think there are, there are there are hybrid models that can join, join up the different areas of, of someone's kind of balance sheet and financial priorities and, and help people where they are. But, but I think it's a really good question, Amber, because the focus today is workplace savings, but I think that has to be joined up with helping people access affordable credit, um, helping people save as they pay off that debt um, or save when they finish paying off that debt. So, you know, 
I think in the context of salary finance, for example, where you're, you're offering loans and you're offering saving, how, how do you join those two things up so that when people finish paying off their loan, it automatically becomes savings? How, how do you kind of make that journey easier for people so they're not having to make difficult decisions on, on where do I put, you know, if I do have five or ten pounds left over, where do I put it? Thank you. I'm going to try to get a couple more questions in, so we'll, we'll take one just here. Then can you get this one, I think? Thank you. Uh, Joe, you mentioned how beneficial yeah, it has to have £1,000 of saving and how impactful that could be on someone. Is there not scope for a regulatory uh, or regulator inter intervention to say, actually, all or part of your legal minimum requirements to go to alter enrolment should produce a savings fund over the next 12, 18 months at, at either 8% of the current minimum or without tax relief, say 7% of someone's say earnings saved very quickly just over the next 12, 18 months and just step away from saving for pension? Yeah, I think, um, I think that's a question that people are asking right now. You know, I'm certainly aware of one employer we've spoken to that's exploring, can we divert some of the the kind of minimum pensions requirements somewhere else for our employees. I think you've really... Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think, you know, employers are sort of trying to work out, how, is this legal and, um, you know, could I do something different? And, and kind of how does that, that play in with some of the concerns about sort of coercing people out, you know, out of pensions? So I, I think it's a really good question. Yeah, no, it's so good. I'm a, a governor at the Pensions Policy Institute as well. and. We did a report last year on the future website. If you have a look at PPI's website, um, it's free on there. And, and that essentially kind of highlighted the barriers really to, well, you, you, you've managed to circumvent some of them in, but there, there's clearly barriers there to the different products. And it, it almost ideally recommended a fund in which government, you and your employer can contribute, which you can draw on for a limited number of purposes, your education, your pension, your housing. Um, and I think that concept is a lovely one, it, but at the moment it's extremely difficult to operate. But I think, you know, giving employees some choice here is, is really important and having some of these products available. Um, and again, we, you know, we are in a competitive labour market. We've got record number of vacancies still. And so, um, you know, employers are, you know, in the NHS, uh, some bright spark at the same time as Brexit decided to remove the nurses. Um, uh, nurses didn't have to pay student fees. They didn't pay the nine grand a year. Guess what? Some bright spark in the Department of Health decided to remove that just at the time we were losing uh, EU nurses. Um, and uh, it's been reversed now, but it was very interesting. What you saw immediately was the top London hospitals paying it. So they said, we'll pay it for you. Pretty much thereafter, all the London hospitals did it. It spread out from there, uh, and they, they've done that for about three years before the government saw sense and put it back in again. So I think there are these, these ways to help in addressing debt, to, to your original question as well. It, it's, it, you know, but you have got to be very creative and, and persistent uh, to get them in at the moment. There's definitely something on that tax relief position that maybe the Chancellor will surprise us later. Who knows? Uh, one final question in this session. Yeah. So it can be hard for leaders to associate um, with financial challenges with workers. Could uh, areas like payroll department be key as financial education ambassadors for them? Maybe we'll go let, let Joe take that because Joe's touched on some of the payroll thoughts. But you know, payroll as financial ambassadors, uh, where does the voice need to come from, Joe, in workplaces? Yeah, I had a really in interesting conversation with someone uh, last week who, up until very recently, has always been in a position of financial security, but in the current context of mortgages going up and had sort of felt a kind of financial precarity for the first point in her life. And she talked about the empathy that that gave her for people who are in positions of financial precarity. So, so I think... <laughs> There is something about being able to listen and listen hard and understand the experience of, of your workers. And, you know, I think a lot of that sits with payroll because payroll are the people who, you know, answer the phone call that I can't get to the end of the month. Can you help me? And, and so perhaps they're more tuned into that. But I, I think, you know, as Duncan said, kind of listening and understanding where your workforce is at and what their particular challenges are and segmenting that and understanding how to support the different parts. Is probably something that goes across the organisation, but yeah, I think payroll are often 
tuned into that. Do you know, on an area I've done a lot of work with on gender pay gaps and closing those, and payroll folk rapidly became HR's best friend on that because they understand what the patterns of pay are. Um, but and employers met their minimum requirements, had to publish it, but then realised their employees are reading this stuff and potential recruits are reading this stuff. And now I think the, the organisations where they do their, their reward and benefits communication really well, they've got a team. Payroll's pulled in right at the start. Not typically what HR does is redesign a scheme like Ian's and then right at the end they'll say, oh yeah, we'll better contact payroll, make sure they can do it. Pull them right in at the start. The other folk are your communication professionals. You know, they've got a very different take on this and sometimes the lawyers take over, I think. And it's about getting a balance. It's got to be a balance. Um, I did the gender pay gap report for the London College of Fashion, which must be about the only one in the sector that, because of its female, largely female workforce, actually has a negative gender pay gap, which means that ladies actually get more. Um, and their comms person was going, God, yeah, you know, let's go out with this. Let's really, you know, contact all the main press, etc." And you kind of say, having, they're not that big, and having seen some of the variations from year to year, um, you know, we tempered that back a bit, we're a little bit less modest. But I think that balance of understanding your pay and, and how you can administer and control it effectively, uh, having folk with Ian's experience in rewards and HR, um, as well as hopefully some policy specialist input from outside and comms colleagues. I think that is, the, is that sort of team approach brings together the skills to really make it good. And obviously in, involving your employees as well. Um, you know, two of the remuneration committees in the sector I'm on, we've got student reps on the remuneration committee that sets the pay of everyone, include, of the senior folk, including the vice chancellor. So that involvement of the folk themselves. Yeah, fantastic. I'm going to have to draw this session to a close, but fascinating conversation. Joe Duncan, thank you so much for your insights today. <laughs> OK, I'm now going to hand over to our next Insights session. Uh, Sarah Peretta is the Insights and External Engagement Director at the Money and Pension Service and will we'll be talking us through the regulatory direction of travel on pensions and savings strategy within the UK work environment. So I'd like to ask to come to the lectern, Sarah Peretta. Thank you. Um, I'm not quite going to be talking about regulatory policy, <laughs> um, uh, so I'll, I'll deviate from that slightly, but I'll hopefully keep it relevant. Um, so thank you, and I just wanted to congratulate University of Lincoln and Cushion for this brilliant event. And it's very enlightening, really, to hear about an employer that's kind of every buzzword and everything I believe about why financial wellbeing impo is important was in that opening speech and in everything I've heard since. And I think, don't think we can underestimate, you know, it, it's, it's just an amazing thing when an employer, you might have someone like Ian who sees the light, but you have to convince lots of other people in your organisation that this is a good thing to do at all levels. And to get to that place where you've put something like this in place with a thousand um, students enrolled in it is a, is a huge achievement and we need more employers like that so I just wanted to kind of call that out and it makes me feel great to be sitting here listening to, to such a great achievement and I'd like to be doing that every day of the week frankly. Um, so just a little bit about who is MAPS, why am I standing here? Um, so there's an, uh, oh I'm clicking aren't I, sorry, we, so we didn't do that did we? Yeah, so um, I will be talking about strategy and I'll explain that in a minute. So we are the Money and Pension Service. We're an arm's length body uh, sponsored by the Department for Work and Pension. Um, and we have, a, we have a commitment to ensuring that people throughout the UK have guided, access to guidance and advice that help them manage their money, that help them make effective financial decisions. Um, and we also commission a third of the debt advice across the UK and we deliver money and pensions guidance as well. So um, people will be calling up the Money and Pension Service to help with pensions queries, money queries. And obviously, as you can imagine, at the moment, we're quite busy. And we have a consumer facing brand, which is called Money Helper. Um, we also have a very important other role. There we go, um, which is um, it was the, the law that set us up. 
um, also laid out that we should develop a national strategy for financial well-being. So that's the strategy I shall be talking about today. Um, and the, the wording of the law is that we should convene and coordinate others in the delivery of that national strategy. So we set off um, a couple of years ago now and went out to stakeholders all across the UK. So we, we ran a kind of six month roadshow process um, and we asked people, what are the key drivers of financial well-being? Where should the money and pension service be focusing its attention and energy? And where should we get other organisations to, to focus their attention and energy? So this was the product of that. So this was published in January 2020, before COVID was a twinkle in anyone's eye and before the kind of economic situation that we find ourselves in today. But it still feels quite relevant. So currently, 5.3 million children do not get a meaningful financial education in the UK. Uh, Nine million people often borrow to, to buy food or to pay bills. Eleven and a half million people have less than £100 in savings, which you've heard a little bit about already. And 22 million people don't know what they need to do to plan for retirement. So there's some big gaps to fill here in terms of people feeling that they are in a position to make the right decisions about their money. So this strategy lays out five national goals. The first is around children and young people's financial education. The second is about savers, which is obviously what we're focusing on today. Um, and getting more people to start saving. Um, the third is about credit, so um, particularly focusing on those people who use borrowing to, to make ends meet on a, a kind of day-to-day -day basis. Debt advice is about getting more people to access debt advice earlier um, before things get out of control. And then the fifth one is to help people um, have the right information and guidance and confidence to make the right decisions about retirement. And that's, you know, throughout life. So even the young people that we'll be hearing from today is like making those decisions about when they start saving into a pension and what that looks like. So after we publish the national strategy, oh, I should add as well, there's some important lenses across that strategy. It might be quite hard to see on screen. So we looked at initially groups that had the poorest outcomes. So, um, we, had, we heard about the, the gender gaps earlier. So we particularly looked at gender um, and whether we needed particular initiatives that might address gender gap. And also looked at mental health because we know that, you know, for example, in debt advice, half of people um, accessing debt advice in the UK will report that they are struggling with mental ill health. So there's a huge kind of intersection between those. And there isn't the, the, th the further lens, which we don't have written on that strategy, um, is one around workplace. So we see employers as a huge opportunity to reach more and more people and to help us achieve those national goals. Um, so after we published the strategy, we then set up what we called challenge groups. So we didn't want steering groups to steer those goals. We wanted challenge groups and they were task and finish groups with a kind of finite period that they met. They were chaired by very influential people and they involved all sorts of experts across the UK. And the challenge we set them is what do we need to do to start on that journey? It's a 10 year strategy to start on that journey to, towards achieving those national goals. So they each came up with recommendations for a delivery plan. And we've since published a delivery plan for each of the nations of the UK that lay out you know, evidence gaps that we think should be filled, initiatives we think um, organisations could work with us or on their own to take forward. And as part of that, some organisations made pledges to, to take forward certain activities. So that is all happening now. Those delivery plans are being put into place and monitored all across the UK. Um, and we talk a lot at MAPS about a financial wellbeing movement. And when I was listening to the Q&A earlier um, and having done this for a little while, as I think our, our speakers have as well, um, we... When we were laying out this strategy, we envisaged a, a kind of, if you think about the journey that mental health has been on in the last 10 years in the UK, if you roll back 10 years, nobody really talked about it. Nobody really knew what to do about it. Nobody really understood the impact it was having in the workplace. Um, you know, colleagues, HR departments, uh, managers weren't really upskilled to be able to support colleagues with mental health. It was a taboo subject. You hid it if you had a mental health challenge, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I kind of think financial well-being. There are so many parallels between that movement and what we're trying to achieve in, in um, financial well-being. And over the last few years, you've seen you know, really senior leaders, you know, chief executives of some of the biggest banks in the UK talking about mental health. Um, you've got things like mental health first aiders where, you know, huge swathes of people have been um, upskilled in the workplace. It's part of line management training. The taboos have been reduced of talking about mental health. The business case is well understood of investing in it. And that's what we want to see. And I think we are seeing happening in financial wellbeing. Um, I went to a conference um, between lockdowns um, in Birmingham and it was a, an HR conference and I gave a speech about financial well-being and I asked people in the room are you here because 
you get it and you're already doing stuff on financial well-being and you want to hear what I've got to say. Are you here because you've kind of heard about financial well-being and you, you think it's something you should be doing but you want to find out more? Or are you here because you have literally no clue about financial well-being, you saw it on the agenda, thought you'd come along? And I think if I'd asked that question a few years before, most people would have been in the third bucket. But it was about a third, a third, a third when I asked that question. And I honestly hope that in the next couple of years, if I asked that question again, it would be 80% of the people in the room are already doing it. They've already got a financial well-being strategy in place. They get it. They're seeing the benefits for their employees and they want to do more. And I think we are, we are genuinely in the midst of a movement. And I kind of share your sentiment a little bit that um, the current economic situation actually provides an opportunity to talk more about this stuff. More employers are kind of suddenly feeling what it feels like to have a workforce that are really struggling, really stressed about money. And maybe it was a bit invisible before, but it's very hard for it to be invisible now. And so employers are kind of forced into addressing this, the unenlightened end, or the people that have been maybe sitting in their um, workforce thinking, God, I'd love to do this stuff, have now got an opportunity to really get it into in front of senior people in the organisation and convince them that now is the time. Um, so the next slide is a bit of a deep dive in what we think is important for young adults in terms of financial well-being. And I had a chat, I kind of made a beeline really for some of the young people that are here today when I was having my coffee in the world's most enormous pastry that I still haven't worked out how to eat um, <laughs> during the break. I've just sort of left it on a chair and hope for the best. Um, about, um, about their experiences, because um, I think anyone, as you age, you sort of always feel like you're kind of just a little bit older than 20 or something, don't you? Sort of don't, it creeps up on you. Um, and I'm 45 now, but when I was writing this presentation, it sort of reminded me of <clears throat> what it's like to be a student and having to make all these decisions about money. And I was reflecting on some of the things I got really wrong um, and then what I learned from them and, th and things like that as well. And um, I mean, I think there's a lot of stuff on this slide and I'll go through it now. But it is incredibly difficult for any young person to do all of these things. I would say almost impossible for any young person to, of their own volition, achieve all of these things. Um, but they are also needed. So that's a real dilemma. So I'm just going to talk through some of them before I, before I go on. So um, there's one there around social media. So just being careful about risky money-making schemes. So I asked the students I was talking to, do you know anyone that kind of got a bit stung by crypto or investment schemes? And they were like, yeah, particularly in COVID where you were kind of sitting at home and fall prey to that kind of thing. So that's a real challenge. And, you know, a lot of us that are designing these schemes, we, we don't have lived experience of being bombarded by stories about crypto you know so we have to recognize that there are new and emerging risks for young people that probably the people in a position of power who are designing these programs just don't get so we really need to engage with that um start saving into workplace pension as 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 soon as you are eligible well that's a really tricky one and i was talking to the two young people i was talking about a kind of case study a me case study b my husband so my husband took the approach of well, when I earn a bit more, then I'll start paying into a pension. And then suddenly he was 35 and hadn't started paying into a pension. And that is all too easy to do. But I get it on the other side of, you know, when, when you're really cash strapped, that little extra going into a pension just feels like an impossible task. But the problem is middle age creeps upon you far too quickly. And then suddenly you're facing a tiny pot and, and, a, and a retirement that's kind of coming down the tracks at you. But it's very, very, very hard to convince any young person, and, and I was one of those too, that it's something they need to do now. So employers really have to think about how can they make that decision or make that as easy as possible. And obviously opt out schemes really do deliver. Um, insurance, again, talking about that, any young person you talk to will be struggling with that. Insurance is very useful and necessary. It's also incredibly expensive. And things like car insurance now is so prohibitively expensive. It's a big thing for young people to think about. So, but talking and thinking about insurance is still something important to engage with. So building a savings buffer, we've talked a lot about that today. It's a no brainer. It's not difficult to convince people that they should save. It's very difficult to get people to save for all of the reasons that we discussed in the previous panel. Um, knowing how to seek guidance and advice, um, if you're falling into financial difficulty, that is really important. We need to make it as important easy as as possible for people to get that guidance and advice as soon as things are starting to go wrong not when they've got kind of very very tricky um, accessing confidential well-being and support um, near to peer so peer support is a really important element of helping um, people engage with this stuff um, and then building your credit score so you know i know that that is a conversation and credit score if i've ever spoken on a panel with young people there they kind of ask about credit scores and it's a sort of 
dark arts and it's a worry for people, um, but it is something that they need to engage with as well. But that is so much to take on and any young person, if you kind of laid that out and go, right, all you have to do is that. They're, that's impossible. It's very, very difficult to, to do that. So we need to focus on how do we overcome inertia? How do we reduce friction? Um, how do we help people make those trade-offs between, you know, well, I can't really afford to pay into my pension now because I'm trying to pay for car insurance and I need the car insurance because I, I need to earn. And, I, you know, the, the only jobs available in my area are kind of 100 miles, 10 minutes drive down the road or whatever. Um, I think we need to use the evidence and find the gaps and fill them um, around what, what don't we know or what do we think we know that we don't have any evidence for in order to build programs? So um, just thinking about a few things that employers can do. Um, offering workplace pension and, and driving engagement in that is really important, but also thinking about moments that matter. So we know that it's easier to engage someone at a decision point. So what are those decision points that are happening in an employee's journey where they might be more receptive to guidance or decision making? Um, you know, if they are joining the workforce, that's obviously a really important place, but they'll be making decisions later on as well, maybe saving up for a car or something like that, or later on becoming a parent. These are all important decision points where your finances change and there's an opportunity to talk to people. Um, employees can look at, as well as saving products, loans products, insurance, um, some flexibility around how wages are paid. So there are other things like that. And, you know, I love that example of that American company that was just being practical about what actually what is, what is the biggest barrier? The biggest barrier is the student loans. Okay, how do we work within that? Because you can't remove that barrier. So I think understanding and really talking to um, employees about why they're not doing those things and then trying to identify ways that you could remove those barriers or um, reduce the friction or reduce the inertia is really important. Um, I think I mentioned peer-to-peer -peer as well. Um, that's something that there is some evidence about how that works. We'd like to build more, um, particularly with young people, near to peer is really important. So rather than, you know, someone 45 talking to a 21 year old about making decisions, it's can you get, can you link up that 21 year old with a 25 year old or a 26 year old who's just recently made those steps and it's really recent lived experience and it's really relevant to the here and now. So those kind of programs work. Um, we've talked a lot about behavioral nudges and um, opt out. So I think looking at behavioral insights and understanding what are those barriers, where does what's driving the inertia um, and how might you overcome that is really important. I think the final one, and it relates to that comment I made earlier about mental health, is talking about money. So we run a week called Talk Money Week, which was, was it last week, Michael? Yes, last week. It feels like five years ago now. It's a very busy week um, last week. And that, that really is about how do you communicate about money, break down the taboos about money, make it part of your employee culture to share those success stories or, you know, maybe someone's talking about their kind of youth and the mistakes they made and how they might have done things differently. Um, hints, tips, nudges, um, make, you know, sharing success stories about how people who have taken part in these schemes, it's made changes to them, but make it part of your culture and talk about money and break those down, those taboos. Um, So we talked about this already, and I kind of feel like this slide should have come a little bit earlier in the presentation in some ways, but um, the business case is really important here because um, I think I meet a lot of enlightened um, people that want to do more in the workplace, but really convincing senior leaders within the workplace that this stuff really is having an impact already is quite challenging. And I worked at a bank for... Um, Eight, year, eight years, something like that. And I've been at Money and Pension Service five years. So we're talking maybe 14 years ago, um, I set up a financial inclusion steering group within this bank. And this um, HR person asked if she could come and present. And she came and presented and she said, I, basically, we didn't use those terms then, financial wellbeing. She was basically pitching a financial wellbeing strategy for the employees of the bank. And these very senior leaders said, well, you know, we're a bank, so none of this stuff really, it's not happening to our colleagues. They're not struggling with money. And she kind of got kind of shunted out. And I often think of her because she was so ahead of her time. And of course, that is total nonsense that people working in a bank won't be, you know, potentially gambling or going through a divorce that's creating difficult or might have overstretched on a mortgage or any other thing that happens to everybody else as well. Um, so that was kind of an interesting time. But she was recognising, and I remember her real pitch, is that money worries are there. 
even within our workforce. It's a cause of stress, it damages business, it drives staff sickness, and the business case is really compelling. So we know that 4.2 million worker days each year are lost in, abs in absences due to poor financial wellbeing. So that's um, £626 million pounds worth of lost output due to worries about mental health. So seven in 10 UK employees believe staff performance is negatively affected when employees are under financial pressure. Um, so there's lots of evidence and more of it on there and I'm not gonna go through all of it, but people lose sleep over money worries and they're coming into to work, trying to do their job, having lost that sleep. And um, w employees themselves say that stops them performing at their best. So the business case is there and I think the opportunity is there now to talk more and more about that and why it's important. And, you know, some of the evidence base is growing and growing to then help you work out, OK, I've identified the problem. I get it. What do I need to do? And, you know, Nest Insights and other organisations are just pumping in more and more evidence of if you do this, this will happen. These are the rewards you will get. So I think it's really important to just keep focusing on that evidence and overcoming the biases as well, because, I had a conversation again with a bank recently um, and it was in a kind of open forum where we were saying, um, is there an opportunity to now for banks to look more at um, a customer data and recognize patterns of where things might be going wrong? And then say to that customer, we notice this is happening. You might want to think about this and they're providing guidance, for example. And this was a very senior person in that bank. And they said, oh, well, um, people don't like to feel that their bank's interfering in their lives. Um, and he kind of got stopped in his tracks because there was a, a policy unit there that said, well, I've got this evidence that shows the opposite, which is that um, bank customers already think that banks are looking at what they're doing. They already think they're keeping an eye on the transactions. And so actually it's not a huge leap and they don't necessarily resent it if, um, if a bank takes that proactive approach. So that's a really good example where someone in a really big position of power was relying on no evidence. He was relying on something he just thought to be true, but he hadn't kind of stopped and looked at the evidence. And that's why evidence and following it is so important, because if we can then use that piece of evidence that policy unit has and go to that bank and say, actually, this is what customers really think, and therefore you could do X, Y, and Z, and then the landscape would change and you might be able to get people to guidance quicker. That's really important. And I think opt-out is another great example of not just assuming that People won't like being opted into something, that they'll resent it, that they'll find it kind of overly interfering in their lives. The evidence base is now strong enough to say that just isn't true. But five years ago, people might have been more reluctant. So I think for employers, it's saying, what does the evidence actually say? Then go and talk to your people and really get under the skin of what do they feel about it? Then go and build a programme around that. So evidence is super important. Um, so I think my final message would just to say, build that business case. So it's strong enough that you convince people in your organisation that you need to do more. Focus on the benefits and celebrate the benefits when you put programmes in place. Really pat yourselves on the back when you put a strong financial wellbeing intervention in place that makes a difference to people. Make it as easy as possible for employees. I focused on young people today, but of course the same would be true of, of any employee. Really make it as easy as possible for people to be making those right decisions and setting themselves up and building their financial resilience and follow the evidence and overcome the bias. And then the final one is be brave, because the thing I think we would say about what University of Lincoln are doing is they were pretty brave. You know, they kind of went out there, tried something that tried something new and the rewards are now speaking for themselves. And I chatted to some of the young people who are so grateful and so confident because of this savings buffer that they have. And we were talking about the opportunities that they're going to realise to go off and travel or do a placement abroad. And, you know, that foundation of having that savings is actually unlocking opportunities which are life changing. Um, so I will stop there. And I think the plan is for Michael to join me on stage. Michael is um, in my team and he's the lead on um, workplace savings. Um, he's worked for the Money and Pension Service for quite a long time. Michael and I worked together when I was at Lloyd's Banking Group before. Um, so I thought it would be great if he could join me on stage. He knows more than me. Um, and then we can answer any of your questions. Oh, should I stay here, actually? Yeah, because I'm not mic'd up. I'm not mic'd up. away the seriousness of the last few years in terms of the social aspects and the economic aspects it has been a real accelerator for opportunities for change 
I was just wondering if, uh, following your, your money week last week, whether you've seen a different response from employers. Is the door more open to people wanting to have conversations with the money and pension service about what can we be doing? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we've actually been in this kind of amazing and yet difficult kind of position where some very large employers have said, we now want to put stuff on our pay slips about money guidance or, or things like that. And we've had to think about whether we can cope with the volume that that might create. But that's a nice problem to have. So employers we haven't seen before are, are taking that leap. And I think that's, you know, we're really, really seeing a sea change there. Um, because they're recognising, well, they're, they're seeing employees that maybe have never struggled with money. Um, and this is kind of a new issue for them. Or everything that's in the media and the fact that more people feel like others around them are experiencing challenges are talking about it more in the workplace. So I think the landscape really is changing. Fantastic. Michael, anything just to add on that from, from last week's activities? Yeah, uh, what I'm finding more and more is um, employers are discovering, those that were at the start of their journey are discovering it's not that great a leap. And small steps, just small steps can quickly build, you build more evidence, you build more confidence as an employer that this is the right thing to be doing. And that opens up so many more opportunities to be creative, to really think about the needs of your workforce and put in place sustainable approaches to improve their financial wellbeing. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, one more thing as well, actually, which I was yeah. going to say. So one of the things we're looking at at the moment is developing a financial wellbeing pledge, because there are employers out there that are doing great things. And we want to recognise and put some structure around that. And we also have partnerships managers all across the UK that go out and engage with employers. So we're sort of packaging up best practice in employee wellbeing and then going to go back out and we've already got quite a few organisations involved create that sort of recognition but to, in order to encourage other organisations and give people a menu of you can if you do these three core things and pick from these five other things and here's the evidence base off you go it's almost creating a ready-made business case and strategy that people can then put into place and I'm sure we've got lots of people in the room who'd be interested in that <laughs> so we saw how that progressed the mental health activities that we said we feel like we're following on from and the uh, the employer pledges around mental health seem yeah. to change again the attraction of the employer and the employee's relationship yeah. okay let's open for questions from the floor hi um fiona brown from rolls royce plc um what thoughts do the panel have on how we adapt reward packages and build financial resilience for young people when we're going to be moving to a more gigs, swarms and skills-based ways of working. So I, I mean, in an ideal world, I think we would say go back and get under the skin of what the needs and barriers and challenges of, of your workforce are. Because some of the conversations we have is if you, sometimes those packages and, the, and, and benefits are, are put in place without necessarily understanding exactly what's happening in the workforce. So it might be best practice, but is it best practice for your workforce? Do you really know what their challenges are? So I think colleague consultation and colleague engagement and co-design in that is probably the way forward. And for the reasons I talked about earlier, where you just got to make sure that, you're not, that you are relying on evidence and that you are overcoming biases. And so if there is an evidence gap, and in your case, I would say, unless you absolutely know what your workforce wants and needs, then you do have an evidence gap. But we also have the kind of tools to help you do that and, and find out about your workforce. So I think that would be the first step for me is understanding what do employees want and what does the future look like and do some scenario planning of where you're trying to get to as well. And Michael, you might have a question. Um, I was just, just reinforcing those points about um, making your package of benefits as flexible as possible, reflecting the segmented needs of, of your workforce. Um, really get under the skin. So, so in our, when we work with employers, what we, we, we urge them to take a uh, plan, do, review cycle. That approach to understand. So first of all, really understand as deeply as you can the needs of your workforce, then put in place a plan to, to meet those needs. And then to complete that cycle, measure the impact of what you put in place. And through those processes, where you can, um, embed some flexibility in your package of support to reflect different needs. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. Um, understand as well, I think, especially for a younger audience, younger workers, 
um, the way they harness and use technology to, to build their financial security. Um, and then within, within those, those technological nudges where they can understand the financial trade-offs that are really impacting on them at that stage in their lives. And then it applies all, all, all the way through life stages. But the more you can do that, the better outcomes it is for that individual. They see the value of engaging with it and you can build that relationship as an employer. And, and Michael, we often look for one size fits all solutions as employers, because that's human nature to look for the simplistic approach to something. Are we at a stage where when we talk about those that will be entering the workforce, we talk about people perhaps working longer and we might see more of that trend with the current economy as it is. Are we in a position where employees need to be a little bit more creative and perhaps the most efficient way of one size fits all isn't what's going to work? And we think about how you know, some will adapt more to a technological solution than a traditional method of how we do things. Do we need to be more creative? I definitely think, think that is the way forward. I understand the financial pressures that employers face. Clearly, they, 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 they have to uh, look in the market for solutions, for, for putting in place um, benefits packages. And the one-size-fits-all model might be more economically advantageous to them. I understand those pressures, but I think there is an opportunity to reap more rewards by really getting under the skin of Clearly, you can't have a, a, an individual package for each employee, but you can segment your work, the needs of your workforce, I think, more intelligently, more creatively, uh, put in place um, solutions that approximate more closely to their needs at that, that point in their, their lives. Yeah. Brilliant. Let's take some questions. <laughs> Hi, um, whose responsibility is it to educate and break the stigma surrounding financial well-being? Do we approach it in the same way as mental well-being or are there other, other factors holding us back? Do you mean in education at younger age or kind of in the workforce? In the workforce. Um, so the responsibility thing is a really good question because that's one of the challenges that we have to, that, that mental health had to go through and also we have to go through in terms of financial well-being. So we kind of talk about a triangle of physical well-being, mental well-being, financial well-being. And, you know, if you go back and kind of look at Quaker companies years and years ago, they thought a lot about physical health. I used to work for Cadbury and they invested in education, they invested in sports and activities, and that was part of what employers offer. And I think we went through a period where that became less and less, but I think it's going back the other way. And, you know, you've seen, certainly I've seen in my career, um, I also worked for Microsoft at one point that had this incredible campus that was all about health and well-being. Never about financial well-being. That wasn't part of it, nor, me nor mental well-being in those times. But I think more and more employers, it's not their responsibility, but there is a business case showing that there are real benefits of doing it. So I think the more that we build that evidence case and the more that we get you know, best practice employers showing what they're doing, then we move forward. But the responsibility question is a good one because it's not, it, in some areas, some elements of the, that triangle are a legal responsibility for employers. Financial well-being is a bit more of a grey area, but I think more employers are recognising that this is something they should do, want to do, will see the benefits of doing. How would you suggest that um, organisations or educational centres support their staff in providing information on financial well-being? Um, so we work with a lot of employers. Our partnership team that I mentioned are out and about talking to employers. So we have, we have guidance and advice that's available. It's free of charge. It's government-backed. And we help organisations just do a really simple thing of getting, that, getting links to that guidance and information about that guidance or white-labeled content even into their infrastructure. And so that's just a real, you know, sort of simple start of attendance. If you were sitting there thinking, oh my God, I've got into a bit of difficulty with money, where do I go? And you find that information really quickly at, at your place of work, that's great. Another thing we look at is how you equip peers to have that information or ma line managers to have that information, etc. So I think there are ways to do that very easily. And then obviously you can build on from that. And Michael, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that because you talk to a lot of employers as well. Yes, I, I think uh, reinforcing the point you made earlier, Sarah, about, Sarah, about the, the, the power of near to peer. I and mean, I'll give a tangible example now. All 18-year-olds for the next seven or eight years are going to be inheriting their child trust fund that's been in place since their birth. 
Yet we know around half of those 18-year-olds don't know about the Child Trust Fund and aren't accessing the money in it, which could be several hundred pounds that have been accumulating for, for 18 years. Um, I'm, I'll do a quick straw poll here. Um, how, how many, I'm, I'm hoping to be pleasantly surprised. Um, how many of you have, if you are Ireland, how many of you have accessed your Child Trust Fund? <laughs> uh, that's two hands raised. Um, how many haven't or, or think they might have a Child Trust Fund that they can access? <laughs> okay, no, here, yeah, but, uh, but you get my point. So that power of near to peer, if, you've, if, if you know that you, you have this benefit, this asset that the government has put in place, the previous administration put in place to enable to build a bit of financial resilience for you, and you can share that experience with, with um, younger people, um, say, look, in a couple of years' time, you can, you can access this, and here's how you find out about your account, here's how you access the money, Here's how you continue saving if you don't spend it all. Um, you know, that, that, the power of those things, I think, are really important in the workplace. Another important point is you don't, and this applies to employers as well as people who work in these organisations, is we're not expecting you to be financial experts. But there are plenty of places that you can signpost people to with that level of specialism and expertise. So... Being confident to be able to identify a financial issue that a colleague may have and then be able to signpost them to relevant forms of impartial and hopefully free support, I think is an important mechanism here that we'd like to embed more fully within the workplace. Yeah, and just to add on with the trust fund, and being a university student, and I think a lot of us have seen, and financial education is key and we lack that in our education starting from um, secondary school up to universities and what's the right pathway to educate us because a lot of us imagine you have access to your trust fund what do you do with that how do you budget it and if i had access to a trust fund which i do not what i would do is i wouldn't even touch it i would leave it as a savings but how do you educate the young people the right way of savings and how important savings is to the future. To add on to what um, the panel said earlier, how, it, how the majority of, of the UK population don't even have a savings under uh, over £100, which is quite shocking. But being a university student and having access to funding from the government and seeing the peers um, alongside me, I see how we handle money is actually not intelligent, but that's not because we are being stupid around it, it's just we don't have the right education to show us how to handle the money. So the question is, do we start off, or who will allow this to happen at a young age in academics? So it can be a teaching or it can be a, an, a seminar room which happens at university. How do we fit that on to young people's life? <laughs> yeah. um, so one of the pillars of the strategy is about financial education for children and young people. So we see it as a blend of different channels. So we see schools have a big part and it's patchy in the UK, whether it's on the curriculum or not, because there are some schools that opt out and things like that. And also the big thing we see as well is that um, even where it's on the curriculum, teachers might not feel confident to teach it or they'll, they'll build it into a lesser or a greater degree. So we know that it's very patchy in the UK where the children and young people receive a meaningful financial education. Our evidence shows that children before the age of seven can build up a savings habit. So we know we need to start young and we know we need to do it all the way through. So uh, we see it as schools and communities and parents are three different ways we need to address this. So our delivery plans look at interventions that address all three so equipping parents with you know key messages and around pocket money and talking to your children about money and how to do that is a key area um, thinking about community organizations because formal education is one route but we've got to make sure that we reach the most vulnerable children and young people some of whom are more likely to access that learning in a community setting um, and then also training and helping teachers and providing them with the resource to teach it well so 
we, this is a journey, it's a 10 year strategy, but those are the three ways we're looking at this and trying to then build interventions. And our role is then to coordinate all of the players in this space. So the biggest investors of financial education in the UK are the retail banks. So one of the things that I've been doing for the last year is chairing a forum with all the retail banks to say, can we agree on a common set of outcomes that we're trying to drive? And then that conversation has helped those organisations who are investing, I think, nine million a year in financial education to really then focus their programmes on the evidence and on outcomes, not outputs. And what I mean by that is rather than, you know, I trained five people, it's those five people now know how to do X. So much more of an outcome. Um, so we're doing that kind of work where we coordinate and convene others to try and improve financial education. But employers then have a role as well, I think, because if you leave, and universities have a big role too. So I think it's thinking about all those touch points and decision-making points and trying to build it in. And I went to something in Northern Ireland a few weeks ago at Stormont, and it was the launch of a textbook for teachers. And there were teachers there sort of waving them in the air going, I, I'm an art teacher and I've built this in, in this way in my class, and I'm a design teacher. And, you know, so it wasn't math teachers and it was, you know, it was really creative teachers thinking this is relevant and I can make this relevant in any subject. So we need to get the teaching kind of profession to feel confident that, well, see the benefits and have the confidence to be able to deliver as well. But we're working on that. And it sounds like it's all part of that longer education picture. Yeah, it was so part, it needs of the to start, it's part of the national strategy. Start yeah. earlier and have it so it's entwined alongside whatever other activities are yeah. going on. Yeah. Just final thoughts, Michael, I'll leave with you before we bring this session uh, to a close. Just building on, on Sarah's points um, and just emphasising the fact that, that financial education doesn't stop when we leave school. Um, it continues and, and employers have a really important role to play in ensuring that at those touch points, those key decision points in people's lives, that they are there as a, a, as a point that people can use. As I said, the, we're not asking employers to be financial experts, but they are a trusted point that people can access and then find the, the answers to their particular financial yeah. set of circumstances. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, if we could just thank in the room Sarah and Michael. <laughs> Another fantastic, insightful uh, conversation, and that's where the conversation starts rather than finishes. We're now going to take a short 15-minute break in the room. Uh, please rejoin us at 11.15 for our next session on the importance of financial well-being and the impact on mental health with Dr Alex George, the UK Ambassador for Mental Health and Steve Watson, Director of Policy at Cushion. So we'll see you all after the 15 minute break. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back, everybody, and welcome back to those joining us on the live stream. Uh, I'm going to dive straight into our next session uh, and the insights that are going to focus on the intrinsic links between financial well-being and mental health. And I'm delighted to welcome to the stage Dr. Alex George, UK Ambassador for Mental Health, and Steve Watson, Director of Policy and Research at Cushon. And again, we'll leave time for questions at the end. So over to you, Steve Thank and you. Alex. Thank you. Alex, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, a bit of a hidden agenda before we start. That's always a scary start. So you know your title, UK yeah. Ambassador Youth yeah. Mental yeah. Health. Well, we want to put in uh, financial well-being into that too. So we're going to widen your portfolio. Yeah, OK, add to it. Add to it. <laughs> but seriously, this is what this event has been. And I know when we initially um, spoke, um, there was sort of, um, how, we, how on earth could you be connected mm. to uh, financial? But um, we've done recent research, we've done res research before. There is an absolute definite link between financial well-being and mental health and, you know, the, the, you know that correlation. Um, and young people especially. Mm. I mean, our latest piece of research is showing, well, well it, it's language that you just don't want to hear, yeah. which is um, people saying, um, I'm terrified mm. for my immediate financial future. Um, and then another stat, you know, the majority of people saying that if they lost their job, they couldn't survive for longer than 30 days, mm. so a month at a time, not quite living hand to, hand, uh, hand to mouth, but not yeah. far off. And then all those stats um, we then got today, possibly now, yeah. Jeremy Hunt delivering yeah, his, much. and um, I think we don't know much, we don't have the detail, but it ain't going to be pretty reading. It'll be hard for everyone, I think. I, I think it's going to be really hard. So the current situation, I mean, financial worries, how does that impact on people's mm. Mental well, I mean, health. even from your even from your your research, but in in general, we know that um, financial health is a huge thing. Um, if you look at um, one of the strongest correlating factors between um, almost anything and uh, uh, suicide rates going up or down, uh, financial hardship is one of the strongest correlating factors. So, if you look at um, like 2008 and different times where the economy has been in recession, suicide rates go up, and in fact, as I say, it's one of the strongest. Uh, inverse correlations that there is with mental health um, and when you look at big surveys of, of populations but especially actually younger people because they're emerging into the workplace and so on they're coming out with debt from university um, financial worries is the biggest concern and anxiety that they have followed closely by climate change and climate anxiety and worry about their mental health in general so that financial worry is huge and one of the things I've always found quite striking is that Financial health isn't talked about at all. A lot of people don't even realise it's a thing. Um, it certainly isn't taught at schools. Um, you know, hands up anyone that came out of school feeling that they understood what nicer was, how inflation works, what interest rates. And it was never talked about. And when you think about it, it's baffling because you go to school fundamentally to gain an education, to get a job, to pay a way in life. That, that is fundamentally why we go to school, right? To gain an, educa gain an education, to get a career, to be able to do the things we want to do. And yet no one at school tells you what to do with the money once you're earning it, which is, which is, baff which is baffling. And then you go and apply to the university, you get given a student loan, and you sign this thing that you have no idea what it really is or how it, how it, kind, of, how it kind of works. You come, you come out of university with all this debt, and you're going, well, how do I now? I've got to pay rent. I need to think about mortgage. Should I save? Is saving good or bad? What is this inflation rate that's eating my money? And, and all of this stuff really mounts up. And in times of hardship like now, when you're looking on the news and seeing all these kind of bleak financial indicators, it's scary for people. Because most people, as you know, most people live very closely between what they earn and what they, and what they have to spend, and especially in places like London. I mean, I started... Uh, on, a th as, on like £24,000 as a junior doctor um, and I think just over half of my wage went on rent. You know, so your ability to deal with squeezing uh, on your finances, even in a profession like medicine, is very, very tight. Yeah. So scary times. It, it, it very, and um, you know, young people, especially our research again, the, the, you know, the more concerned, you know, sort of goes with how young you are. 
Um, but at the same time, um, you know, workplace savings or what when you first join a, uh, um, a job, the first thing that you're probably faced with, other than your first pay slip, is you've joined the pension scheme. Um, and what we're finding and the industry is finding that younger people especially just aren't engaging with that. Mm. Um, and th th there's lots of reasons, uh, uh, hypotheses for that. You know, the, the time period is too long or whatever. Or is it that just people have other financial priorities when they're I think it seems pointless, doesn't it, in some ways? You look at, I mean, I was chatting to one of my consultants, um, this is a good few years back, and he's been working, in, I've stopped in Lewisham Hospital, that's where I was working in A&E until a year ago, to kind of focus on my mental health work, and uh, he's been working there for a long time, over 30 years, consultant, he's coming to the end of his career, and he said when he started as a junior doctor, um, you know, whatever number of years ago, 30, 40 years ago, he said, well, I started working around London Bridge, um, you know, I started on 20 to 25,000, the same money you're on now, um, and I could get an apart, like a, quite a nice two bed in London Bridge for about 50, 40, 50,000 pounds. You're starting on 25 grand, but that apartment is, you're not going to get an apartment under a million quid around London Bridge. So that kind of disparity between earning potential and cost of living is, is ever growing. And so when you come out, and, and I'm just talking actually from my perspective as someone that's gone through, I'm 31, 32, but you, I've come through that kind of, I think I've lived a bit of that as a lot of people have around the room. You come out of that and you go, well, what's the point of worrying about your pension when I can't even think about getting a mortgage? I can't, I'm never going to save enough to be able to, be able to do that. And I think that it's very hard to future think about your finances when you're actually faced with difficulty. You know, that, and, and that's, again, I mean, without sounding too academic about mm. this or theoretical, mm. there's something called Maslow's hierarchy of yes, needs. Yeah, of course. And, and, and it just fits very nicely into that, you know, where, listen, you've got to have your basic needs met mm. before you can self-actualise, which is about thinking about the future. Mm. So until I get on the housing ladder, and until I can manage my debt, don't ask me to to think about 30 years or 40 years time. Yeah, for sure. Now, you look at Maslow's hierarchy is that kind of the building blocks is like your food, water, shelter at the bottom and it builds up as you go there. But if you look at other models of health where you put like you as a person in the middle and you have like, it's like rings of health that go around that it starts with your controllable factors and things become less and less controllable to the outside, like things like government policy. I mean, yes, you can vote, but your actual ability to affect that is quite minimal. Like we don't really have, none of us in this room have any power of what happens today. It's kind of done by people we don't have con particular control <laughs> over. Um, so that's on the outside, but right on the inside of things that you, you, know, you, you, you can control. I think the problem is, is that our financial futures has drifted more and more from, away from our individual choices, i.e. our careers that we take what we decide to do with our money away and, and moving more and more to being controlled by people on the outside. I think that's what's challenging. But, you know, going to a sense of like then taking control of things, you know, there is always things that are inside your sphere of influence and things that are outside. When it comes to like your health, you have to think largely about those things that are on the inside. You know, and broadly the things that affect your health, you know, um, most important things having a purpose in life. And I think that's the other part of education and, and going to university and, and progressing yourself. Yes, it's the pay the bills but purpose is so important without purpose no other health change you'll make matters and you won't stick to any of that stuff and then it's you've got to sleep a bit sleep relatively well get some sleep uh, get some exercise have generally good people uh, uh, around you eat reasonably well and not do too many things that are damaging towards your mental health and that kind of all comes together to be your physical uh, and your on your mental health and, and undoubtedly the financial side plays into that so I guess for young people now, it's kind of thinking, right, this is the world, this is how it is, what can I do, you know, in the day to day to try and do my bit to either reduce the stress and pressure in terms of your experience of the pressure of worry around financial stress, so like things to cope with that, and then secondly, things that kind of help alleviate that, and I think you're going to come on to some of those after. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, Alex, just in terms of, uh, again, your generation, mm. Um, you know, all the research shows that, you know, it's, that, that's where the challenge is in terms of engaging people, not just with pensions, but also with getting off the starting block, mm. uh, block of savings. Mm. And, you know, we often talk about something called an intention gap, mm. where I know I've got to do it. Mm. I know I need to start saving. I know for whatever reason, and there's loads of reasons, affordability is one of them, but there's loads of other reasons, I never get around to doing it. And one of the, 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 the biggest subjects today, and why, you know, a big reason why we're here, 
is talking about um, trying to break that inertia mm. uh, because we think that maybe the intention gap is about I just don't do it there's no real reason I just don't do it so what if we automatically put you in mm. and you start yeah. saving from and we found that people actually stick mm. with us yeah, they stick to doing that. And I think it's part of the challenge. I wonder, because I was talking, my mum worked at NatWest Bank for many years. She's retired now. She worked for 30 plus years. And she was a generation of save, savers. We're now ta told, as young people spend, and in fact, the government actively encourages spending. You know, we talk, oh gosh, we stop spending. You know, the economy will collapse and whatever. But I think we all just spend so much more, don't we? So there is a natural, we are almost encouraged not to save. And therefore, if you're not opted in, automatically to things you're just not going to do it because that's not what everyone else is doing everyone else is buying clothes eating out all the time spending the money pay tax paycheck to paycheck and i think that's where people don't have maybe that rainy day money that we kind of people used to talk about and that's where it goes month to month because all of a sudden you're you you know you're like oh gosh i didn't i haven't got that aside i've, I've spent that and so do you think do you think that that's actually one of the biggest issues is the fact that people are choosing to spend I think, I think uh, this is where I think education is so important. Why would you do any different if you don't understand? Like, I, 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 I mean, we don't teach at school or university anything about this. So why would people do any different? They're just going to do what they believe everyone else is doing. And regardless of whether that's ne necessarily the correct decision or not. But yeah, and the other challenge, I guess, is that people find it hard to think what's the point of saving when inflation rates are flying up because then you, what your, your, your pound is literally devaluing before your eyes. So I think the part of it is like, teaching people about the benefits of saving, but also what to do with your money and where that's invested and how, how that works. I think, I think investments and just broadly, and this is just out of my own interest one thing, I think investments and stuff, unless you actually actively look and learn and try and you know, understand it more, um, then you're never going to learn about it or you'll or even worse end up with these Forex traders that are, <laughs> people are uh, advertising Instagram to make you millionaires overnight by investing in foreign exchange. So I think there needs to be a better system of, um, yes, I think safe, safe, uh, processes whereby employers can maybe have automatic opt-ins to save in to saving money each month but I think also the education is so important teach people about what how inflation works what what you know how do we decide what what, what is an interest rate how do banks decide interest rates and then like what, if I get this I got if I got 200 pound 300 pound a month each month I could put aside what do I do with that and what is the end goal with that money because I don't think the end, the end goal used to be I'll save and get a deposit on a house but are you going to need you know, if banks are lending four times salary, you're going to need probably to buy a flat in London Bridge. If you're on, a, on an average salary in London of 30, 40 grand, you're going to need 400,000, 500,000 in cash deposit. There's not many people that are going to save that money. So we need a different end goal. Yeah, yeah. And maybe there's a number of different goals. Mm. I think that's, you know, financial mm. goals. And I think that's something that we've been exploring is, you know, retirement is, is the end goal, mm. you, you know, you're 30, 40 years away from that. What happens mm. between now and then? Mm. Um, so if you're, you know, if I'm doing nothing or I've got no help for those in-between events, yeah. I'm not interested, but suddenly if there's something here, a rainy day fund I'm saving for, getting on the housing ladder, um, a wedding, holiday, whatever those events might be, maybe it puts in context. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's like maybe changing the thing of always like looking to that it has to be I'm saving for a house. It could actually, you know, to fill those other little pots. And my mum used to talk to me about like think of little pots that you have and each month you put a little bit in each pot. And I found that really helpful. So again, having like like goals that I think are also because, you know, as humans, we, we, we often stick to habits either because we're disciplined either because we're extremely disciplined with ourselves or because we have to or because there's a sense of reward and that sense of reward is a dopamine reaction so um, if you can create a bit of a dopamine hit by knowing you're adding it up each month and you're getting that benefit from doing it then 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 that helps us because otherwise your dopamine hit is you know buying that new jumper or that hoodie or whatever it's going to be do you know that's an interesting point because um one thing that we do see is, um, and from um, a project that we've been running at the University of Lincoln, is that you automatically put people in, the opt-out rate is really low. Yeah, sure. You know, people stay with it, um, but they also engage. But for instance, us as Cushion, um, you can name your pots. Mm. So you might be able to put the holiday fund, you might yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. And, Experience sort of suggests, and maybe that's a dopamine sort of reaction, which is, right, no, that pot is for that. Mm. And so I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to touch it mm. unless I really, really have to. 
then they won't touch it. Yeah. And I think, I, I think you know, humans work towards goals, right? If we understand why we're doing something, then, then you, you go, you're going to be able to stick to that. And I think that's why I said the most important thing for anyone's health is purpose, because if you don't understand why you're focusing on sleep, why you're exercising, why you're engaging in good relationships and habits, why you're going to stick to any of it, and that includes your financial health as well. So having that purpose is at the middle of it, and I guess in terms of finances, like why am I doing this? And that's why I go back to that point that I think like my parents' generation, they were saving to buy a house. But for many, they don't see that as an achievable goal, especially if they plan to, say, live in, in London or so on. So you need to create other goals that are achievable, that therefore, you know, actually build your, or encourage you to actually do that. Okay, so how about if I put um, a sort of a hypothesis design to you again, which is, um, you know, workplace savings, what employers have mostly focused on is and continue is pension and yeah. it's retirement regardless of how old you are and of course there's a legal requirement to do that too um, but throwing out their choice which is hold on pensions are important you know saving for retirement is important yeah, but recognizing you've got other um, financial goals um, what if we gave you the choice okay some can go here some's got to go in for the long term but some you know here's some that can be uh, to help you get on the housing ladder. Mm. Here's some that, uh, you know, could go into this particular side. What do you think about a model? I mean, I wouldn't opt out. I think that's probably the answer. You wouldn't opt I out. Wouldn't opt out. Yeah. I think that's a good system. I think when I initially, when we spoke initially, I thought that's such a great idea because you're, in a way, you're removing an element. There's always choice, of course, but you're removing an element of choice, which in some ways is good because otherwise it just lands in your account and you just spend it. I think our propensity as humans is often to spend what is there, you know, and it's like that kind of... If you look at the modelling, that more people earn, the more people earn, generally, the more they spend. They buy more expensive coffee or more expensive hoodie or whatever, more expensive holidays. They spend more and more unless they create kind of parameters around that. So I think that's a great idea because, yeah, you then and also you feel like, oh, it's quite nice actually because that's going in that pot. And I, I don't, you don't then have the stress of thinking, oh God, I now need to try and split this money up. Like it's, so, it's stressful trying to manage money yeah. on as a whole. It's stressful, you know, whether it's a small pot or a bigger pot. It's still stressful. Uh, money creates its own problems, but um, you know, having that uh, automatically put aside, you feel like that's a good thing. And I, yeah, I would not doubt. I think that would be something I would keep. So you mentioned a couple of things there. So do you think? Um, so our research suggests again, you know, savings. It's not having savings is mm. stressful. Mm. Um, but it, I, I think that there's a few more layers to that. It's um, is it about control? You know, so what, what, what's stressful is when I don't feel controlled. So if I'm one of these people who um, I'm concerned that if I lost my job today, mm. I've got to find a job pretty quickly, I've got 30 days, you're, you're not in control. Yeah. So is financial well-being about being in control? I think so. I think having... I mean, there's very few people that could, wouldn't be worried if they lost their job tomorrow. I mean, you know, it would affect me, it would affect any, anyone else. I'm pretty sure you'd think, oh my gosh, we've got bills to pay, this is, this is scary. So having some ability of buffer, I think, is a, is, it helps you so much. And also, I think there's an element of understanding. Often the um, unknown unknown is, is terrifying. So, like, you're not aware of you know, what's going to happen if that happens, like, oh, do I have a buffer or, you know, it's, it's understanding or at least having an awareness of, right, if this goes wrong, this is what's there, this is how long I've got and this is what I can do. I think often, you know, we, we kind of bury our heads in the sand with problems. There's a natural kind of thing. It's like, oh, I don't think about it, then think about it. And then it becomes a problem and it's glaring you in the face and you're kind of so unprepared. But sometimes you get just, just the discomfort of not knowing is unpleasant in itself. So, you know, I have to, when myself, I kind of, try and force myself to like face these things head on and go right let's let's deal with this because I naturally think oh gosh I don't think about that whatever that's a bill that needs to pay later that's probably my natural standpoint and I think a lot of people are probably still I, I think you're right the financial think, services oh, as a whole yeah don't want to think don't want to think about it um but I think especially in these times it's important to understand where you're at if, if nothing else just to know even if it's a bit scary to look at you at least you know where you stand uh, and have you can create a plan of action if the worst case happens so, you know, that, that's really the value for me as an individual, being in control and, um, you know, perhaps having that choice. Um, some employers might turn around and say, well, you know, pensions is a legal requirement. Mm. Anything else isn't. So you're on your own. That's your problem. Mm. Um, and many would question, some employers would question, why should we get involved? You know, what, what, what's the return on investment for mm. us as an employer? 
Well, I think partly, I mean, financial worries and stress. If you look at, so not last year, uh, mental illness cost the economy £90 billion. Pounds. It, um, it's a huge sum of money. And we know that the biggest cause of, uh, of worry and anxiety and stress uh, is finances. So if you can support your employees, you're going to see the benefit from their mental health productivity and so on. Because ultimately what happens outside the workspace affects what happens inside the workspace. And, not, and I've got a team that I employ, I pay staff. And I am very well aware that the biggest stress I have is, is their stress off. Yeah. I worry about my staff. I mean, I don't quite buy into this thing that employers don't care about people that work for them. Maybe that's true of few people, but most people are very invested in the people that work with them. So if you feel that you can do something good and, and support them, or that alleviates stress, not just in terms of their productivity at work, but also help them as human beings. I think a lot of people would be on board for that. I don't see why you might have a handful that wouldn't be, but I think most people would want to see how they can support. And if there's a buy-in there, then why not? Okay. And, and, and do you think it's important to create a safe space at work? Mm -hmm. One, to be able to talk about mental health mm -hmm. and, and one, to talk about money worries. Yeah. I think people are very afraid to talk about money in general, aren't they? I think we're quite, in Britain, we're quite, about talking about finances. I mean, my parents would never have talked when I was growing up about money. They couldn't talk about it in front of me. It was, you know, you couldn't possibly, I couldn't even be here like a, a, how much of a sky bill was or something like that. They were very like, we don't talk about money. I'm not even sure they talk to each other about uh, money, to be honest. Um, maybe there's a reason for that. I don't know, dad's been tucking it away. Um, he's not shared any of it, that's for sure. Um, uh, so it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like something we've grown, it's kind of a bit of a stigma that we've grown up yeah. with, which is odd really. Again, it goes back to that point, like we go to work to earn money. Of course, the luxury, it's an absolute luxury as well-being is to be able to work for joy or work for your, because you care about something, yeah. you know, like we are privileged if we're able to do that. And many people have to work because they have to work. Um, and so, um, and that's the only reason, you know, that's their primary goal and their worry is always around money. So I think it's an, it, is, it is a luxury we can think about it, but certainly I think we should be more open talking about finance. If we know that's the number one cause of worry and stress for people, then creating an environment where that conversation can happen is, it's got to be a lot healthier, isn't it? Well, yeah, and also, you know, one thing that um, I think about is regardless of who you are, what you are, etc. You don't keep something back when you arrive at the office. No. So whether those are positive things or negative things, you're bringing them into the workplace. And uh, you know, whatever's concerning you, a sleepless night, money worries, etc. It's got to affect productivity levels. It's, it's going to, and I also think, especially environments we're in now, I think businesses, big and small. Um, employers and employees all are worrying about different things. Like I, I have concerns as an employer um, and as someone that has to, obviously a lot of what I do is, is volunteering, but I have to run a business as well. I have to fund everything that is what I do. And so I have to think about everything that's going on. So you're kind of in it together in a way. There's clearly, I'm not saying everyone has different um, stresses and worries and people have, there's people that really, really are struggling, like literal hand, hand to mouth and so on. But I think there, there is more connection there's more that I think connects people in terms of finances and worries than I think people realise. Yeah. I think we all kind of worry about things. And also you can worry about other people's worries. That makes sense. So I'd rather have a situation where people could, could, talk, could talk openly. And I think I'm, maybe it's because I've got a small business, maybe it's the nature of what I do, but I, I have a very open relationship with, with people that work for me. I kind of talk to them about everything that's going on and, and vice versa. And we have that openness. And I think that really helps because then you feel like you can deal with things early on rather than burying a worry and then you find out they've got extreme financial hardship at home because the sharp end of it is suicide. I mean, that's what we're yeah. really talking about, you know, and um, especially with men, we know it's a huge burden, that kind of archetypal stereotype of men got to be breadwinners and, you know, keep quite hush about the money troubles, um, you know, not talking to the family about what's going on. And, you know, we look at 2008, look at even now, um, we, we, we're beginning to see a rise in suicide rates and, and, and there's no doubt that the financial side plays a part. And you just wonder how many of those suicides could be prevented with good communication or a, a team approach, even within the family, but also a workplace approach going, right, how can we support this person? Like what's going on? at home because it dev it's, dev it's a devastating loss. You know, we lose, um, we, you know, we lose uh, so many lives each year to suicide. Around 80 people a week take their lives in the UK. Um, and it affects the whole, it's, it's, it's the ripple effect. You drop yeah. a bucket of water, drop a little pebble in and it ripples. Everyone that's worked with that person, anyone that's known them, 
in their lives. And, um, you know, as I say, when we know that the financial uh, hardship is one of the strongest indicators, I think there is a moral duty for employers and for people in the workplace to consider how we, you know, support people. How do we have that conversation? Is it actually pointing them in the right direction to um, charities and support services that they can go and get support and advice from how to deal with issues with loans or worries or mortgages and so on? Yeah, so maybe it, it, that's where that education comes in and also the signposts and also choices. Mm. So it's maybe looking at workplace savings mm. differently and saying, right, okay, how, rather than this is for that, this is for that, let people yeah. educate them and give them the choice. I guess my counter question would be like, what, what, so right now when people are really worrying about things, can, uh, is, can they truly save? When people, you know, we've seen the energy bills as high, I guess that's the reverse question. Is, is, it, is it time to save? <sighs> Right, so a good question. But in my mind, um, the, the, you know, the cost, the, the cost of living crisis is very much a two-pronged issue. So it is about how do I cover costs today? How do I survive today? But it can't just be about that somehow it's also got to be about future financial resilience. Yeah, yeah, true. Because otherwise, I'm just moving, well, let's just think about two years of COVID, mm. okay? That there were some winners and there were some losers. Mm. I mean, um, there was um, this concept of accidental savers during lockdown where- okay, yeah, save money. Yeah. yeah, exactly, you know, people were actually saving in expenses and they did actually take that money and they saved it. Mm. Um, there was concern about whether people would actually spend that rather than continue saving. I don't think that that, that was a, a, you know, a, a real worry. But so it is about covering costs today, but you've got to build that rainy mm. day fund. Otherwise, you, you, you're just in this spiral because COVID was an issue strictly, a, a very quickly followed by the cost of living crisis. Yeah. We know where there's a recession come in. Yeah. Okay, and we've warned that's going to be two years. We'll wait and see what happens today with the um, autumn statement. But what's next? Mm. So there's got to be mm. there's got to be that financial resilience that comes from saving too. Yeah, I guess, and it's starting. It's that point. It's starting small, isn't it? Like every little that little amount. And that's it. I mean, you know, um, um, you know, a very old saying from little acorns grow oak yeah. trees. But, but it's true. You've got to start, and what we have found, and especially in the um, in the workplace, is once you start, mm. it it becomes very sticky. Mm. It's a habit. It's a it's a very easy habit to form. Mm. And then if you've got ideas about what that pot is for, mm. you know, you're going to be quite. Most people are quite rigid with themselves, and in yeah. terms of. That's what you know. Yeah, that's well, what I'm going to use. Well, I guess it, it goes back to that fundamental thing. As humans, we're we're much better um, when we form habit. Is much more powerful motivation, and then add on discipline, and you've got a really good result. Is that kind of you've got the idea of like if you look at people who uh, start a gym membership in January, 95% of them aren't still going to the gym in February, and so much of that is because the fundamental flaw of relying on motivation. Motivation comes and goes; it will never ever stay. Um, so you have to create habit and discipline. Um, so accountability in yourself. So the people who stick to the gym is because they go whether they feel good on whether they want to or not. They go to the gym whether they feel they're motivated or not. And that's fundamentally why they keep going. And then they see that their motivation comes and goes. And as it goes, it comes back again. And you feel that kind of high of like, I've stuck to this and I feel great. Even when I didn't feel like doing it, it's a compounding benefit. So I guess a similar idea with saving. It because, works oh, exactly really, the same. I really actually want to go and do this. I know I'm going yeah. to stick to what I'm doing. And then you have that really good sense of reward um, of, of doing, but fundamentally you've got to create that habit um, in the first place. And I guess that the easier story to think of is um, the more, it's kind of, again, the gym analogy. Um, if you have to, well, we, we know um, that if people go to the gym somewhere that's more than two or three minute walk from their house, two or three minute journey from their house or their workplace, the chance of them um, sticking to it is, is, is absolutely tiny versus if it's, buy a house, buy a workplace. So you're removing reasons not to, or ways that you can kind of fall out of that, that habit. And I guess like by having it automatically in, you're preventing that barrier. Even if you have to click transfer, or even the thing of setting up a direct debit to another account that's gonna save money, that for a lot of people, will, that'll cut 50% of people out of it immediately, because I can't bother to set up a direct debit. <laughs> you see, but now isn't that, you see, in the industry you look at you, you think, well that surely ain't much effort, but it's friction. Of course. 
Well, look at Amazon. I mean, their whole base is they try and reduce the number of clicks. So they want one click, ideally. They'd, yeah. they'd love it. You just buy and it goes straight through. Otherwise, they can't. They did two clicks now, isn't it? You can just you can immediately buy something straight through. If you click on something on uh, Instagram, the next click is buying it. You know, so how can you? You're losing people at every obstacle. So if you remove yeah. the obstacles for for a positive, you're losing less people. Yeah, exactly. I'm just how are we doing with time? Timekeeper. <laughs> Sorry. I think now would be an excellent time to, right, to open excellent. up to do some, yeah, some Q&A. Can... And, and just to, to kickstart a Q&A, um, Alex, you touched on there what sounds like the last taboo in the workplace, which is how do you break the stigma attached to talking about finances? Mm. Uh, we saw that the mental health stigma was really broken through leaders talking about it. Yeah. We spoke earlier about how professions like payroll can break some of that <coughs> workplace conversations that perhaps leaders relevant to finances isn't always the case. Do you have any thoughts about how we do break the workplace stigma mm. on talking about mm. finance? Well, I think if you look at the comparison with the male mental health, we know that we know that uh, men are uh, between three and up to nine times more likely to take their own life and, and commonly won't talk about it before they go and do that. And you think, why does that happen when women don't? And fundamentally, it's because of how we've, the culture we've ingrained within men and women. If you look at uh, the way men are brought up, you're, if you, I remember, tripping over as a kid, if I cried, I'd be told, man up, you know, grow some balls, yeah. don't be a girl, all this kind of, kind of, ah, be a tough man, don't cry. And you have that kind of constant um, cycle fed into it from what you see on TV, films, whatever, people that behave around you, this is what it is to be a man. And then we're shocked when people at their weakest moments that they aren't able to turn against everything that's been ingrained with them and ask for help. Whereas what you, what you, the way you see uh, women, um, uh, the culture around how a woman is brought up through childhood, it's very different. It's around conversation, it's community, it's talking, and therefore often the problems will be dealt with a lot sooner and discussed sooner. And also there's less friction, there's less, there's less difficulty yeah, yeah. in having that conversation. So if you compare that with, with finances, I guess the stigma around that is like talking about money is showing off or you know, talking about it is like that should be something you keep privately. It's very much like a, a stigma thing. And the only way to change it, I think, is, is top down. I mean, we talk about it in male mental health. You need male, a senior male role models, so people that are in positions that have perceived power to talk about things, because then other people that are maybe aspiring to that feel that they, oh, hang on, this guy that's you know, an international rugby player in one of those toughest sports, he's talking about his mental health oh, then it's all right for me to do so. It sounds very simplistic, but it's absolutely true. Um, look at within the army, and like what they're trying to do a lot now is like within the Marines, for example, is getting like, like sergeant majors, senior people in the Marines talking about depression, talking about anxiety, talking about mental health, because they're the people that the guys come in and are aspiring to. So in finances, yeah, I think it's people at the top of companies and businesses, people that, you know, people's bosses talking about it and coming coming to the table, not always from a position necessarily of weakness, coming from a position of strength and going, do you know what? I got myself in a muddle of money five, 10 years ago. It was really, these are the lessons I've learned. And it goes back to that thing of like speaking to your elders as well. I mean, we could all learn a lot probably from saving, talking to our parents. My mum would bring probably great advice from years of saving and stuff like that and these little pots and stuff. Yeah. So looking up and, and getting the advice there. Fantastic, let's open to questions with the mic. Um, so we talk quite a lot about like the importance of like awareness and like financial literacy and that sort of thing. Mm. Um, but I also think it's really important to talk about like social media. I know mm. we talk about it in terms of mental health and there's like massive positives but also really huge negatives. Mm. And like the role of social media and financial wellbeing, like I just wanted to ask a question around like what your mm. thoughts are on that. Yeah, well, I think the scary thing is that there's a lot of people that actually sadly do prey on people who are worried or they, they, young people who are like into Forex trading and stuff. You've got these guys on Instagram that have no financial background, banking or whatever background, and they're selling these like get rich packages or whatever, which is terrifying. I think there should be a lot more done about that. There's very, I don't think there's a huge amount done to actually bring these people offline because that's dangerous. But I think, I think again, it would be great to see, like anything, positive role models online talking about financial health, but not with the angle of let's get rich. Because that's always the conversation you see generally, isn't it, online? It's kind of, if it's talk about finances, or always like quick get rich schemes rather than sensible, balanced approaches to financial health, which is a very different thing. There are some influencers that do it, there's some people that do it, but not, not enough. Oh, and, yeah. and like anything, you know, social media, is it good or bad? It's both, depends how you use it. It is just a tool. It is us as humans that use that that make it good or bad. It's A, the contents put on there, but also how you engage with that. So I think a lot of people find it 
find compa well, comparison is one of the biggest issues on social media, not just in terms of body image, but I know from talking to people who are like consultants and psychiatry, from to people that are at businesses in the 40s and 50s who compare, but in terms of success, or this person's written more papers than me this year, or and I hear, you know, it's not always people talk about body image, but I think that's that's just yeah, it's much wider. It's much wider. The finance is a huge thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, oh, that person's got that. They've been on that many holidays and so on. So I think in terms of protecting your own mental health, it's kind of thinking about what you're seeing online, both negatively in terms of comparison, but also thinking about where you're getting your financial information from and not taking it from forex, <laughs> yeah. forex sellers or whatever. Hi Alex. <clears throat> Something you mentioned at the beginning was the two things affecting people's mental health when they come out of university was finances and also climate change. Climate change, yeah. Um, and actually they're quite correlated yeah. because um, pension pots by nature where they invest their money can finance uh, climate change massively. I think mm. the average pension pot finances are like 20 tonnes of CO2E. Mm. I'm quite interested to know mm. what shifts you've seen on the climate change affecting mental health in the last couple of years. Mm. And also maybe what employers could be doing to support employees on that. Yeah, because I think everywhere people look they, on that point as well, the conversation around like Bitcoin mining and how like how damaging that is for um, for uh, the environment and stuff. I mean, I don't know the ins and outs to make a comment either way, but I think you see a lot of these stories around the place, don't you? So both in terms of like, right, I'm going to do this with finances, but then if I put it in this pot, oh my God, am I funding some kind of oil thing that's happening out there? And I think young people really do worry about there's a real sense of like duty about if I'm going to invest money, where is this money being spent? And actually I'm very aware of that as well. I don't want to put money somewhere I think it's going to go and uh, go to something that I don't want it to. And I think when you don't understand and don't have that education, that causes a fear. In terms of climate, I think it was fascinating that in the last COP meeting, um, the Royal College of Psychiatry posted about the climate change. And most people are like, why are the Royal College of Psychiatry get involved in this? And it's because we know that climate anxiety is, is massive. I cannot uh, explain how big it is in young people right now. You know, I, I travel around the country, around the whole UK, speaking to young people at schools, primary, secondary and universities. It is a genuine huge worry. One child said to me a couple of weeks ago at a school, um, a smart kid for 12, I think it was 12 or 13, he said, I think we're the first generation that could, can conceivably consider the end of the world. That would really, like, there really is, it really are, like, there's, like, are we going to be around? Because, like, it's all very well. I said, even your generation, your 30s, we're the ones that are going to see it. We're the ones that are going to see proper house fires in London because it's so hot and the the water level rising and you go gosh it's 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 it's, it's hard sometimes because they are the people that are going to face it so it, it is a it's a huge worry and i think that is why you know if we look at um so the, the biggest glo the, the mental illness is worldwide the biggest global uh, illness in terms of burden burden of illness it's so expensive so mental illness is probably the most expensive thing to to deal with because it affects every part of society and every part of the economy that's right, about 90 billion pounds last year, um, the, the cost economy on, of, uh, of mental, mental illness. But some of the things that are not accounted in that is that what if those people were well? What would, the, what would their contribution to society be if they were in if the workplace, they, yeah. if they were well, if they were positive, had positive contributions? So if you think climate change is going to cost the economy a huge amount of money, but it's also going to be one of the biggest factors on mental illness, and that's going to have a compounding effect then surely it makes absolute sense that we consider those things as on the same spectrum of issues we need to deal with. And I think maybe, you know, to Ben's point, you know, that the average pension pot does, it contributes 23 tonnes, mm. which is far more than you would um, wow. as an individual, yeah. you know, wow. help finance. And it's sort of, I suppose the question is, does any, you know, do they really care? Or is there just not an awareness of, you know, your money, young people, you mean. young people, you know, at the end of the day, it's about where capital, mm. it's a money game, isn't it? And, and, and so, I think am I aware? Care. I think they do care. I think they, I think they really do care. If you look at a lot of the backlash around Bitcoin, for example, it's massive around um, Bitcoin mining and how, uh, how the kind of uh, climate effect of that or whatever. And that, that, was a, there was, there, that was a massive thing for a lot of people. Then we're like, no, I'm not getting involved in that. So I think they really do care because I think it is... I, we're in a scary time with Russia and so on, but you know, hopefully, things across that gets solved. Um, but genuinely, the thing that we are most likely to see the end of the human race is climate, right? That is it. So fundamentally, that is the thing that they're looking at as the biggest hurdle. And you know, my um, I've got a godchild that was born uh, 14, 15 weeks ago, and you do think for her, like, what is her life going to be? Like, when she reaches 50, 60, what is the world going to be? 
no one, we don't, none of us can be sure it's going to be a good place. We don't know that for sure, do we? It might be, might not yeah, be, yeah. but that is what they're facing. Okay, just bring in a question here. Hi, I'm, um, I'm not sure if you were here for the talks earlier, but I'm Sarah Peretta and I work for the Money and Pension Service and I'm responsible for the UK strategy for financial wellbeing. Um, Steve was kind of joking, not joking, about your role being <laughs> ambassador for mental health and financial wellbeing. So I was just wondering, you're obviously here today because we're, it's an event about money and mm. mental health. Um, how often do you feel like now that really is part of your ambassadorial mm. role to talk about money? Mm. How, you know, we, we talked about climate change as well as other factors, but how much is money part of the work that you're doing? I mean, it's, it's, it's huge. It's, it's throughout the whole of everything that I see from predisposing risk factors for mental illness to how people recover from mental illness to literally what you hear and see in schools, you know, whether I'm in Scotland or in Wales or, or so on. I think it's, it comes up time and time again because this generation don't think they're gonna own their own home ever in their lifetime. Uh, uh, I mentioned the, the, the climate change and the effect that has on careers, but there's so much like uh, fear on job security. They look at university and go, and it's going to cost the fortune. You know, I think I was the 1% fixed uh, interest rate now. What does it hover at? What's the student loan rate now? What is it? I'm not sure it's, what it is. Yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm not a mathematician, but if, you, if you're a med student, you go and do five, six years, allow six years if you integrate. Uh, you're going to come out with underground debt, probably. That's going to be compounded from the minute, first minute you lend the first pound, isn't it, by 4 or 5%. You're going to pay back, as a doctor, you're not going to pay that back in any hurry. Um, it's very slow climbing uh, ladders. So they're going to pay, I think it was like nearly into your 50s as a consultant, 60s, before you pay your student loan off. Um, which I, I, I yeah, it, you know, I, I think it's important we have, I think people should contribute towards their education. I think there's an ownership around that, but I think... You know, it's not very inspiring to go to university if you're not going to pay back your student loan for that many years. But it? actually, you know, um, and Sarah indicated earlier, there was discussion, various discussions around this sort of thing. And one idea was mm. exactly what we were talking about earlier. You know, this is why you've got to have choice. You know, there's got to be, you know, there's got to be responsibility, but there's got to be an element of choice because everybody's coming into the workplace with different financial yeah. needs. Yeah. And one of them is... Student. But to, to your point, I think the, the thing that they feel, the message get again and again, is we don't have control. So much of this feels out of their control. They can't control, you know, it's a fixed, I, I, there's, what is your option other than taking on a student loan? For most people, you know, I had to say, there's not many people can go afford 100 grand or the parents will pay 100 grand for them to go and, and study, unless we have an elitist class of university again, where pe only certain people go to university and others don't. Then, it, then, it's, then it's, it, becomes very, it becomes very difficult. So yeah, it's... I think that lack of control is is the biggest worry around uh, uh, finances. So yeah, it, 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 it's huge. And also seeing, and the other kind of end of it as well, is where is the money going in terms of investment into mental health? You know, we know 1% of uh, the budget goes towards mental health, but then we know that uh, half of what GP sees is mental illness. One in three cases in A&E is, is to do with mental illness. And we know it's one of the biggest burdens on the economy. So. Um, yeah, it's both ends of the spectrum that's worry around money. I think it's reassuring, Alex, as well, to hear that both aspects are being spoken about in your role now. Well, that, it's, it, it, it's one, and my worry, my big worry is today, though, about cutting the budget. You know, I, I pitched the Prime Minister, uh, Boris Johnson at the time, to him and his advisors um, to get £200 million for early support hubs. So this would be 190 uh, support hubs, a walk-in service for under 25-year-olds uh, in England. So 190 of those, which would be one per health district. Um, we'd look to scale those up once we once they were we had all the evaluation and improvement stuff, um, and you know that 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 was two hundred million pounds, which is a drop in the ocean in, in public uh, uh, in public spending. And like my fear is, is that still going to be? Am I still yeah. going to have that pot now? Mm -hmm. You know, we've got Rishi's come in. I've, I've written to Rishi to ask to make sure that money is remaining, but who who knows? So that gives me anxiety, let alone anyone else. We'll sign your letter for you as well. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just take one final question at the back. <laughs> just here. Um, hi, I'm working for Lincoln SC and often what we find out is students are almost in denial of the hardship and they really wait to the last minute to get help. And then our work is more reactive rather than proactive. So what would be your advice on how to communicate those messages to students um, also not to be patronising towards them, but how to 
speak about financial health, financial well-being with them, and what kind of message, mm -hmm. messages we should send to them for well, them to actually understand that yeah. they can ask for help and that's okay. Well, I mean, human behaviour is often to ignore what you don't understand. It's either like ign ignorance, isn't it, is around it. We talk about ignorance and lack of education, or ig ignorance and lack of understanding. They kind of go hand in hand. Sometimes, like, ignorance is bliss, but it isn't, isn't it? So you kind of turn your head away from it and, like, keep spending until it's a problem. I've definitely been there as a student. <laughs> You're like, oh, God, I really don't have enough money to pay the, the rent this month. Um, uh, and so I think it's I think it's the proactive stuff, isn't it? The only way you're going to prevent people being reactive is by by being proactive towards them. So trying to get people to understand like bas basic financial literacy. It kind of goes about the point like mental health. I mean, one of the biggest things I think we could do to reduce the burden of mental illness in this country is teach emotional literacy to young people. Get them to understand what like where do thoughts and feelings come from? How does that relate to your behaviours and your emotions? And if you just create that understanding, then they actually can have at least an awareness, and then they have the opportunity to make a choice. Because you can't solve a problem without self-awareness, can you? Without awareness of a problem, without, you can't solve yeah. it. So that's, I guess, a similar kind of answer. Thank you. Thank you both for you know, another fantastic, insightful session. I think we are all totally reassured to see how the mental health picture is well, being connected know, back into final, financial health and, and how that impacts on workplaces. So can we just thank uh, Alex and Steve for their session? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well. Thank thank you. you. Good work. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, our final session of the day is going to help us draw together the conversation so far in respect to the direction of travel around policy, employers and well-being by actually hearing from the workforce of tomorrow. So our next Insights session will be delivered by Emily Kirkham and Aran Baykut, who I'm so proud to say are both full-time students at the university. And they're going to deliver their insights on finance and young adults and what will make a good employer in respect of supporting financial needs as they, like many of their peers, enter the workforce. So, Emily and Erin, it's over to you. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, the University of Lincoln has chosen myself and my fellow student, Oren, to present to you the effects that the current economic climate is having on young people, specifically how it's affecting their performance in academia and the beginning of their careers. We may not be professionals, like a lot of the people that have spoken today, but this is going to impact us the most, and that's why we feel like it's important for us to speak on this matter. The lack of information regarding financial education at the moment is severely lacking for us. Evidence supporting this claim is demonstrated by our young people, the reports of students dropping out of university, and the desperate rush for part-time jobs during that time as well. The recent increase in bursary applications all go to show we aren't getting the support or the knowledge that we need to financially support ourselves whilst in education, which will detrimentally affect us when going into the workforce. This can lead to complications with mental health and physical health, as we have just realised, and it can mean that we are unfit to work. We, we are here to suggest ways in which this can be improved and the support needed from employers and the government. And it has just been announced by Jeremy Hunt that he is reducing the threshold for the higher rate of income tax. Just to let you know, that has just been announced. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, so obviously as students, there are naturally in the current economic climate, as in September, 11.1% inflation was recorded. So as we are really at the bottom of the pecking order of the financial world, with uh, obviously we were all students once upon a time, so you're all aware of the, the struggles that we go through. But currently in the day of 2022, more or less those struggles have been massively exaggerated with a series of problems that students do face. So the most common challenges that students uh, face are as follows. Uh, student loan repayments are increasing with interest rates that are making it near impossible for young adults to pay off in the current economic climate. Students therefore require money at more urgent rates, so students are seeking part-time employment at a faster rate in order to sustain university living and to better their chances of repaying the loan. This commonly acts as a last resort for many students as it has a detrimental impact on their studies. So as previously stated by many of our speakers today, we're at university to acquire an education, we're at university to then train to become part of the working world. If we are spending majority of our time outside of our lectures and seminars working jobs just to sustain our university living, as discussed by Dr. Alex George, our bare essentials, food, rent, 
uh, you know, academic resources, all of which the prices have gone up, and there's really not much of an opportunity for us to then maximise our education if we're too busy doing jobs such as just working as a barista, working behind the bar, things just to literally pay for our bare essentials. We don't have the equal academic opportunity that may have been available to students before us. Statistical analysis has shown that inflation increased by 9% at the start of 2022 in March. Subsequently, academic interest rates are on a course to increase by 12% unless the action is taken to cap this financial liability. Without a change to this, students will be more prone to drop out due to the concerns of being able to remain financially stable. This is shown on the graph, which is in our, your cushion white papers, which is all everyone has access to, uh, with 24% of students strongly agreeing that they are anxious about their finances due to the economic crisis and 43% agreeing even more, demonstrating an overwhelming need for financial aid and education to these students. A representative, as representatives of the University of Lincoln, we can give examples of what our university has done to combat this. The Students' Union at the University of Lincoln has introduced initiatives such as a 20% food and drinks at Swan and Towers, so basically to discount our bare essentials. It has been reported that to save, it has been reported in Save the Student 2021 that 76% panic about managing finances and effectively sustaining their living. This demonstrates anxiety that the modern student faces. Many students mentioned that throughout the university life, one in ten report never having had the education of this subdivision, which has already been discussed previously. Of this, 41% of students have reported seeking part-time work during term time, and 46% of this are undergraduates. Also from this, the 46% of that 41% are reported to be suffering from disability, indicating that it is all types of students that face the financial concerns. In short, due to the economic crisis, students who should be studying for the jobs the government desire, coupled with a lack of assets offered, holds a damaging impact on young adults. University surveys reported that 32.9% of students dropped out of university without any prospect of further education. So putting that into perspective, you have this massive amount of debt which we all struggle with in our early adult life, but if you drop out of university with no qualification to show for it, you're really in a world of pain. There's massive debt and no real means to pay it off, no high paying job or even opportunity for such to really get rid of it. You might have this debt for the rest of your life. Is you know, unfortunate and even more crucially uncertain what is the future for these young adults. Bursaries and extended grant applications peaked in 2020 during the COVID pandemic. And the backlog of financial faults still causing disarray for young adults years later is shown in the graph about the applications from the University of Lincoln. This has still not led to a full recovery on the level of students remaining in further education. Overall, the solution to the problem lies in the hands of potential employers, as they have the means with creating savings accounts, as current statistics shown in the Cushion White Papers indicate that 13% of students have no savings readily accessible to them during their studies, leading to issues with problem debt. This would mean that more students would have the ability to reduce stress whilst at university about their finances, as they know once they enter employment, they have the option to help support loan repayments. It should also be mentioned that financial education would be beneficial, but that will be discussed later in our speech. So, importantly, the jump to start into careers is virtually non-existent in this current era. Students aren't aware of opportunities that they may have, and one of the main concerns comes from networking. At the University of Lincoln, we prioritise the importance of graduate schemes, events and contacts to ensure that students have the best plan moving into the job market out of mainstream education. Specifically, the University of Lincoln, we place importance on hosting networking events, which is seen a lot within our law society, specifically with the networking dinner, and lectures structured around advancing your performance at work and building key skills and relationships with those applied on into further our careers. This is key to us, and we believe that it should be spread across all the universities if possible, because the sort of experience that we have gained personally is paramount to what we can do further in life. So, <laughs> the measures taken by the university have resulted in student satisfaction ratings reaching 63%, as mentioned in The Guardian, and the university ranking within the top 30. Comparing Lincoln to other universities, the Brighton Network shows that 22% of graduates have no work experience prior to graduating. We realise that this is a main 
issue because a lot of employers for the areas that are desired most want you to have work experience in that sector and students just aren't getting access to it anymore and I think that's key to understanding what we need from employers ourselves. 51% of young adults report that they do not feel confident about their finances and believe that they have made poor decisions about money and financial investment. This affects their consideration for employment as they look for more at pay rather than the benefits that employers can offer them. This means they are inclined to focus on the here and now rather than the growth and experience that some employers can offer. And I feel like that is key to sort of trying to encourage more young people to notice that actually growth is better than the pay because eventually with that growth, you will get more money. And I feel like that is not given enough to us to understand that. And I feel like that is key to this. Although economic factors have decreased in the concerns of students, with only 11% stating it is a concern when transitioning into employment, the current economic climate leads to suggest that this is set to increase. As we all know, we are facing a recession and that is gonna mean that there are more concerns around finance. There is currently still a lack of support for students when transitioning into employment in many sectors, with education playing a big part in this yet again. This suggests that employers need to provide a service that educates students with how to manage finances and transition into work life. It also suggests that networking is key to building a more harmonious workforce and allowing for future generations to have the confidence when transitioning into the workforce. So the main concerns from surveys and studies done, the main concerns for young adults who are recently going to employment, employment are unfair pay, unfair representation and a poor work-life balance, which as already discussed, will massively damage your mental health and your well-being on an overall level. When employers were asked, what do you think the main reason is for your, your new employees, particularly for leaving, most of them replied with, well, we don't think we pay them enough, they clearly want more money. This is not the case. 90% of employers stated that, that, they, that was the reason they believed that employees left. Only 12% of employees actually stated that was the reason that they left. Studies have actually shown that 89% of young employees take into consideration the diversity and inclusion of an organisation before agreeing to employment under them. Students don't necessarily want to be loaded with money straight away, and we don't expect this. We know that we're inexperienced. We might have the knowledge, we might have the qualifications, but what is that if you can't practice it? You know? Many, many, many employers will often say, I'd rather someone with five years experience than someone with a master's who hasn't got a clue. And that is always shown in any workforce. Experience is a better teacher than anyone in school. We all know this from, you know, from our own lives. We always learn better by practicing. This demonstrates that students do not want the money. They only want employment to learn. What they actually want is a harmonious working environment. We seek the chance to grow and prosper rather than the instant reward. This is why a saving scheme may be more important than a pension. The pursuit of reward before work is not the principle that we are advocating today. The principle that we are advocating is encouragement before criticism. Studies show that the number one reason for any workplace dispute, complaint, issue or strained relationship is due to one's voice not being heard, their thoughts and ideals ending at an executive plaque. Ethical standards are of key importance. Number-wise, a study by Robert Walters showed that 73% of employees left their jobs due to a drop in ethical standards. Surveys have shown that the amount of money an employee makes or their personal image is of less importance. The main aspect focused on by young adults is the firm's workspace and culture. What is the day-to-day -day working life like? Does the team work as a team or is this just a motto to bribe the naive into employment? 2021 saw a 21% increase in the employee's desirability to advance within the firm, to learn new, more effective skills. Without any prospect of advancement, the workers who keep you afloat will tire without ambition and the company will sink. An employee desires to feel heard, and a student desires their intelligence to be acknowledged. An employer wants his company to prosper. If we think about it, all of these interests align. The interest in the alignment that the company will become more successful and the employees will be better looked after. Einstein stated, strive not to be a success, but to be of value. Employees are aware, particularly in the modern system, that you are not paid for your time, you are paid for your value. But if there is no prospect of career advancement, then what is to motivate them to wake up tomorrow? Why should they come into work? Why should they work for you? 
Money is not a good enough bribe. Money has never been a good enough reason. By providing better workspaces and by aiding the company in a more complex manner, employees can sustain their life and teach the generation to do the same. We should start solving tomorrow's problems today. And just to add to this, ethical investment is becoming a growing, growing concern for people, especially Gen Z. We want to know that our money is being put to use in good ways and towards good things. We don't want it going towards things that are going to be damaging the environment. We want it to be going to the positives. So, as we've seen before with Dr Alex George just now, there is a direct correlation between suffering from mental health and financial instability. But this can also be linked to physical health as well. All aspects of life are intertwined and we need to be considered as one, not just as individual components. The effects of not having support can be detrimental to young adults and is also a considerable factor when seeking employment. The report from Save the Shoot in 2021 showed that 45% suffer from sleep disturbances, 47% have issues with nutrition, and 65% of young people's social life suffers, which all contribute to the mental well-being and how well students perform at university. All of these adversities lead to the undeniable conclusion of the degrading mental health and the impact on students' grades which was shown with 34% reporting that they had seen a drop in their grades due to the slip in their mental health. In terms of the employer, if the employee's mind isn't cared for, then the business is not cared for, with statistics showing that 65% of students suffered from mental instability due to financial struggles. Without support whilst in the workplace, workers will struggle more and the workload will become too much and they will become overwhelmed. If there is no help for them whilst they're at work, trying to understand their finances, trying to understand how they can balance their work <coughs> and their social life, then there is nothing there for them. They will leave because they are seeking for that support. They are less likely to understand work-life balance and they are therefore more susceptible to mental disturbances as young adults. All of these qualities show incontestably that an employer will receive no benefit from an employee who can't work. John D. Rockefeller, the man who modernised the working system, stated that he wanted a nation of workers. If it's a nation of workers that he's wanting, then there needs to be support. Rockefeller also stated that he would rather hire a man with enthusiasm than a man who knows everything. Being enthusiastic about your work is key. If you don't enjoy it, you're not going to do it to your full potential. You may know what you're doing, but that doesn't mean you're going to want to do it. By employers creating a positive atmosphere, they are more likely to have enthusiastic workers, which will encourage students to want to apply to their workforce. An introduction to supporting them through growth within the company as well, alongside financial education, could drastically reduce the strain of financial instability and therefore stronger balance of their mental health. What also needs to be considered is the impact of relationships and what that can do to someone's health. Having a good working relationship can play into this, making sure that workers feel safe to discuss their personal life and how that is affecting them in the workforce as well. This is all demonstrates the importance of employers creating a safe space for employees and having a key focus on mental well-being. So what is the crucial question? Well, it really is, what can an employer do to keep their employees interested? Because as the statistics have shown, we have a massive dropout rate of people who aren't even employed, students, and then a massive leaving rate of young employees. So how can an employer actually engage with their workforce, with their company, with the people below them? If you want your company to prosper, you need to be caring about the people who are actually keeping it afloat. From previous points, it is quite obvious to see that the main reason derived is a healthy balance between the employer and employee. Recognition of an employee's values, the set of skills, academic interests, and what they've trained for in education. This acknowledgement makes the employee that you selected feel chosen. Employees have read the application and answered your questions. Now guide them on what they need to do. Work not done is unfulfilling in life. Work done well is every employee's dream. So a lot of people may ask, well, what's the best piece of information that you would give to a young employee? I don't think anyone has ever said, take the job for the sake of the money. Take the job for the sake of the fulfillment. Learn the craft. Do something that you enjoy. Never work a day in your life. I'm sure you've all heard that many, many times. If you go up to work, only motivated to find the money, you're not going to do the best job, nor will your employer actually be satisfied with you. We've all worked jobs where we've planned our escape upon employment, especially in our youth. I'm talking from experience.
<laughs> so tying into communication barriers, managers need to show the less experienced workers how to perform, how to excel in their company. We understand that an employee today doesn't care about the money nearly as much as the culture and advancement of the firm. It is the responsibility of the experienced to teach the new. We've all heard of the quotes, if you want to, you know, want the horse to drink, at least take him to the water. If you want to, you know, at least take the horse to the water. If the employee chooses not to work well, despite the resources that you're offering them, that's their responsibility. If you don't even offer them resources to let them excel, that's entirely on you. The go-to for many employers is to invest their workers' earnings into a pension plan so that when they have funds for retirement. This method of financial provision isn't even close to being sustainable in the current economic climate. Young people need education, they need guidance on how to arrange for a savings plan and how to arrange separate accounts for money management. Employers must take the initiative and demonstrate education around savings and budgeting. Older and experienced employers will understand better than anyone in the current financial scale. There are difficulties paying for the roof over your head, providing for the family that you may have, providing for disabilities you may suffer from, or just simply keeping your pantry stop stocked. Basic needs that aren't even being supplied, basic needs that can't even be paid for. Inflation within September rose to 8.8%. Employees need to start caring for their workforce, caring for the workers and educating young about how to actually survive in the current climate. Action is the fire and education has always been the fuel. These are the tenants to a successful company. What we're trying to put across is that the economic support in place today doesn't actually support. A change in workplace regime and financial planning is crucial to help the modern day young adults. So, it was once stated by M. M. Burke that society is but a contract between the dead, the living and those yet to be born. This ties in implacably with what we have been discussing today as it shows the interlocking of all parts of life and the influence we can have on each other. The system we have currently does not work anymore. There needs to be a change for the living and the yet to be born. By supporting young adults' financial knowledge and allowing them to have a way to save their money, they are creating their future and the future for the next generation. Change has to start somewhere. So our student union introduced certain initiatives such as a food bank and free sanitary products to help students with the cost of living. They also provide opportunities for students in terms of work, which allows them to further their financial stability alongside the budgeting workshops. Life is for taking chances and making a difference, regardless of the adversities we may face. So why not help the young adults change the future? Thank you. We are now open to any questions that you may have. OK, fantastic. And, and there you go. That, that really is the voice of the, uh, those coming into the workforce. So just while Erin and Emily just take their seats, and if you just flick your microphones on, and let's open to questions for our student speakers. Question over here. That was really insightful, thank you. Um, at the university, we offer uh, campus jobs, uh, which is the scheme that we're promoting here. And we have um, student financial ambassadors. Is that a role that you feel is incredibly important and should be rolled out to other workplaces to support students um, either working through campus jobs or, or as they go into employment? And also, do you see that as a benefit for when you're looking at employers for that financial education and wellbeing? Oh, absolutely. I think if those ambassadors aren't there, if those people aren't there to sort of tell, well, not tell us, but help us understand our position, how to manage our finances, how to sort of have that transition, as we stated, that is a number one importance for us. If that position wasn't there, I don't think um, many of us would be able to work and I think yes if that was expanded to other workforces I think that would be absolutely beneficial to everyone involved because then you know that once you take that next step there is something to help you understand what that means for you specifically helps you understand okay I can have this pot that I'm putting money into I can also pay off my student debts it's being able to have that understanding, I think, is of key importance. So, yes, I would agree that financial ambassadors are of key importance. Amazing. Thank you. And, and just as a second prong to that question, um, when you're looking at um, 
when you leave university and then looking at employers and what they offer, you've touched about development's very key for you um, in terms of growth and growing your role uh, and, and uh, working your way through your working career. What other benefits uh, would you be looking for uh, with an employer? Is it more around that holistic approach of, of support? Um, yes, completely. Uh, as, as mentioned in the speech, uh, simply doing a job for the money is, is never, never the key and never has been a necessity. Um, with, the, with the assistance of student ambassadors within the financial world, we can also seek to find out what is a good company actually made of. And that could be a, a variety of things. You could have an hour-long debate about that. But the fundamentals that we should be looking for should be key and principle and taught to all students of all ranges. Every single student at university is there with the prospect of entering employment. Now, whilst the specifics may be different for everyone, if you're going to be a doctor, if you're going to be a lawyer, if you're going to be a, a police officer, whatever it might be, there are fundamentals that we all seek to have in certain companies. Again, as mentioned, many students are now concerned with the diversity. What is a workplace culture like? You know, I'm, I'm not here to lecture to any of you what, how to work. You know, I've never been properly employed in that sense. But I'm sure we're all aware we've been in jobs where we haven't had a very fulfilling life. We, you know, we actually hate Mondays, and that's not a way to live. If you wake up dreading Monday, you know, linking to the suicide rates and such, I believe that's where you're going to find yourself you know, contemplating your life. You should enter that work with knowing what your good company is, knowing what they offer, and how can you advance there. You know, uh, you don't want to be working somewhere for 30 years and they give you a slight pay rise because you've, you've essentially just been caught in some sort of trap and you've wasted 30 years of your life. You know, you're not going to get your time back. Money might come and go wherever you go. Your time's not going to come back. So we need to be given these opportunities and more or less promises of advancement within these firms, within these companies, where we can not only be given more responsibility and the higher salary, but also make the difference for then the younger generations, the people behind us to then help them up. You know, I think a lot of employers often like to have this quote on their... Um, on their advertising and such, it's each one, teach one. So learn for yourself and then help someone else bring them up. Most employers should be doing that. They've been in our position. They know what it's like to be at the bottom. Um, and they also know what challenges are gonna face, what struggles are gonna be key. Uh, offering that information to us, having the guidance at university prior to entering employment will make for actually students being healthier within the workplace, having a healthier workforce and making the wise decision as to what their career should be. What are they looking for? And, and just to add to that, we, Dr. Alex touched on the fact about how do you form good habits? How does that habit start of saving and the role of the employer in, in helping with that? Is there just thoughts from you both uh, as, we, as we draw to a close just around when you enter into workplaces, how important is it that an employer is helping you form that saving habit? I think it's of utmost importance. I mean, yeah, I have a savings account. Um, and I make sure I put money into it. But I was brought up knowing that. I was brought up knowing what to do with my money. Um, but I know there are people that are literally a year younger than me that never had that education, have no idea what to do with their money. And I've seen it where they're going off, spending all their student loan, having to go into an overdraft, and they're not understanding how to pay that back. And I think once you go into the workforce, you need to be told, OK, we understand that you've just gone through university, you've got this debt, here's how you can pay it off, here's how we can help in the meantime. I mean, as it was discussed about that um, company in America where they've gone, we will pay for that part of your pension whilst you're still paying back your debt. I think that is amazing. And I think if we could have something similar to that in the UK, that would be absolutely paramount to what we need. And Aaron, any thought on you on starting employment? What's going to help form those habits of saving? Um, education is, you know, is the key. I, I'm a, a firm advocate of where there's a will, there's a way. So I do believe, especially in the current day, if you want to try and make something of yourself, it's possible. It doesn't mean that it has to be made harder for us, in a sense. You know, why would you put extra barriers in our way? Particularly if we're working for you, if we're trying to excel your company, you don't want it to be harder for us. So actually teaching us how do we save our money? How can we reinvest our money? How can we prosper within your company? How can we advance? Uh, I would say, given the current economic climate in particular, which we're all affected by, these would surely be fundamentals that any company would offer their young employees, particularly as prior to being employment, perhaps, you don't get any prior education. You know, we all were taught Pythagoras theorem. We were all taught trigonometry. None of us were taught budgeting or savings or how to manage finances. So if we're not going to learn it in schools, then that's the problem. How do we learn it? 
the employers have to take the initiative. It's the employers who can then teach us how to manage our finances. You know, and they, being particularly old in most cases, and being more experienced in that realm of work, surely they will understand our struggles. If I sat in front of my boss and I said, well, I've got these difficulties with my money, uh, do you think he's going to sit there and go, oh, wow, no, I didn't really expect you to have those problems? No, he's going to understand completely. And then it's up to him to say, well, here's how I managed it. Here's what I can teach you. Or, in the case of a bad employer, I don't care, you work for me, shut up and go to work. So really, you know, what are we trying to achieve here? What are we trying to encourage? Good employers, education, teaching the young, so that we can then teach the people below us. You know, and that's how we're going to solve this long-term problem. As stated, why not solve tomorrow's problems today? And Owen, that's a, quite, a great place to leave that conversation right now. So both stop where you are for now, but can we just thank Owen and Emily for their presentation? <laughs> Okay, well, that brings to an end now our, our first think tank thought leadership event uh, to a close. And I think we've had a great thought provoking morning. We've heard from Duncan Brown and Joe Phillips explaining the change in practices in workplaces by employers. Sarah and Michael offering us insights into the work of the money and pension service and the direction of travel there. Dr. Alex talking to us about those intrinsic links between mental and financial health, particularly focusing on uh, the young workers and our University of Lincoln students who are representing those that will be entering our workplaces imminently and how we can best prepare to them. So I hope everybody's really enjoyed that discussion and I hope we start to have an impact on the future of workplace savings and see the discussion continue. So thank you all for your participation. We hope to be able to offer future thought leadership sessions on this subject as the dynamics change and this journey evolves. But for now, thank you all for your attendance and we hope to see you again at a future event.